Thank you for attending. Uh, this is going to be a presentation on the fundamentals of partial discharge. Uh, my name is Tim Irwin. I work for EA Technology. Uh, we're based in New Jersey uh, and cover the U.S., Canada, uh, South Americas, and the uh, Caribbean islands. Uh, I've been with EA for three years now. And what we're going to go into is we're going to look at what partial discharge is. Um, the basics of it, uh, some of the science behind it. We're going to look at different types of testing, different types of partial discharge. And then we're going to go, go into some examples of uh, what partial discharge will look like in the field. Uh, this will take about two and a half, a little over two and a half hours, and then we'll have questions at the end. Uh, please type any questions you have in uh, during the presentation, uh, we will take a break partway through the presentation and answer questions partway through and then again at the end. Um, so we will get started. What is partial discharge and why is it important to us? Um, as we can see a video, one of my coworkers made in a substation. You see a, a discharging happen coming uh, through. It's momentary. Um, the audio is coming through, which sometimes it doesn't. You, would, you can hear a buzzing in the background. Um, it's temporary. It's not like a permanent fall or flashover, so it'll come and go. Um, but it eventually will lead up to a failure. By definition, and this is using the IEC definition, IEC 60270, um, it's a localized electrical discharges that only partially bridge the insulation between conductors, and which can or cannot occur adjacent to a conductor. So it's a localization, a small discharge within an insulated material or across the surface of it, it can be between the conductor and ground or between two conductors. Um, it's typically a small duration, uh, less than a microsecond, <clears throat> but it will progress. Uh, where can it occur? Typically over 3,000 volts. Um, so you typically won't see it or can't detect it in voltages below that 3,000 volts peak threshold, um, so 480 volts, you won't see it, and it can go all the way up to the 769 kV. Uh, it is AC, not DC, um, and it occurs in basically any place in a power system that has insulated conductors, so metal flat switchgear and cubicles, uh, indoor and outdoor insulators, and of course the insulators. Transformer cable, bo cable boxes, uh, medium and high voltage cables and terminations, in transformers, um, and that, those transformers can be SF6 gas, oil filled or air insulated, and anywhere there's a junction, so termination spouts, bus bar connections, you can have PD, a PD location. Um, how does it occur? Um, it occurs in gas-filled cavities typically or defects in a high voltage insulation. And they can originate in numerous ways, either door manufacturer. So if you've got a solid insulator, say a bushing, ceramic bushing that has uh, an air bubble or a gas bubble in the ceramics or a cast resin insulator with a void or an uh, air bubble in it. Uh, that would occur during manufacturing. And that, that could be a source or a location of PD. Um, during equipment installation, uh, when electrical equipment is factory assembled or installed on site, mistakes can be made, whether uh, it's workmanship uh, with a termination, whether it's putting too, too tight of a bend radius on a cable. Um, it can happen during the installation process. So if you have a cable, uh, shielded cable, it's multi-layers. Those labels are layers are supposed to be bonded together. But if you bend that cable too tight of a radius, it causes the layers to, to kink and separate, and you get an air gap in there. And that, and that could be 
a, a PD uh, source. Aging and deterioration. Insulator will break down with age. Uh, they all have expected life expectancies, and they're exposed to electrical stresses that wear them down over time. And a cable may have a anticipated lifespan of between 20 and 30 years. And you'll find in many industrial applications, many applications, that those cables are 50, 60 years old. Well, over time, the insulation is slowly breaking down. So age is a underlying factor in insulation failure. Overstress the service if um, an asset, an object is exposed to fault currents, it gets uh, stressed. Thermal stress can get some shock, and those stresses can lead to a breakdown in the insulation. And then in service damage. Um, if a cable is struck by something, or a bus bar, an insulated bus bar, is damaged by something dropping on it, and that insulation layer is nicked or cut, that's going to be a, a probable location of partial discharge. Causes workmanship. Um, we're going to see some examples going through here of workmanship issues where and terminations on cables, they're not cut back properly, um, they're not cleaned properly, uh, prep the preparation of the termination isn't done properly and will start to immediately cause partial discharge. Um, contaminations can be soil, coal dust, fly ash, but surface contamination, stuff building up on the outer surface that has a, a lower electrical withstand than the insulation itself can start to conduct. When it starts to conduct, it can break down and damage the underlying insulation, leading to further partial discharge and further deterioration of your insulators. Environment, humidity plays a big role in surface discharge. Um, as humidity goes up, surface contaminants such as salt, dust, etc., become more moist and become more conductive. When they become more conductive, they can cause partial discharge to happen. And during testing, you can have conditions where if you go out on, in a very hot, humid conditions and do testing, you'll see a very active amount of partial discharge. Go back a couple months later when the humidity is decreased, that activity will decrease or go away. So there are very definite tie-ins with humidity and temperature with regards of PD activity. So it's always a good idea to monitor what the humidity is when, do, when testing is taken and make note of it so you can compare similar results going forward. Damage, uh, mechanical damage to the insulators. Um, again, nicks, cuts, uh, impacts that could cause damage. Um, if we're talking a solid porcelain insulator, high wind conditions can cause cracks and damage to, to the insulator. Uh, and even on a micro crack level it, within the ceramics can, can be the, the location point of partial discharge that will slowly break down that insulation over time. Age, we've already discussed, it's uh, insulation material, it's insulating properties will decrease over time. And then design. Uh, some of the components of systems can, can leave high stress areas that are prone to discharge. Uh, we'll look at an example in a little bit of a non-shielded cable on an insulator bar where where they, that those cables were making contact created a high electrical stress point, and it was breaking down the insulation of the cable itself. So just the design of it and the way they're laid out can cause uh, high electrical stress points that over time will deteriorate the insulation faster than if they weren't uh, coming in contact or if they weren't exposed to that high electrical stress. Um, it, it's an inability of a portion of the insulation to withstand the electrical field applied to it. So we're talking starting out very small portions of the insulation material 
not being able to withstand the voltage that's applied to it, and breaking down. Has multiple causes, as we've started to discuss, and we'll see more of it. Typically, it starts small, but it will always get worse. Because every time you get one of these discharges, momentary discharges, a little more of the insulation material is going to become compromised and break down and cause more PD. So it starts small, it builds up until that insulation can no longer withstand the, volt the applied voltage to it, and it flashes over and you have a fail catastrophic failure. Uh, some studies have been conducted, and those studies uh, have indicated that partial discharge is a factor in up to 85% of the unexpected substation failures. So if we take and identify early on with partial discharge testing a problem and resolve it, 85% of the failures, you, our reliability will go up significantly. So it's a very good indicator of an underlying problem. Now, partial discharge may not be the actual root cause of the failure. There may be something else that's causing the partial discharge and leading to failure. So while it may not be the root cause of the failure, it is present during up to 85% of failures in switchgear and, and cables. What is some of the science behind it? We've run into um, audiences, locations where they'll look at us and say it doesn't exist. That partial discharge is voodoo science. Um, a lot of different feedbacks. And early on, and we'll take a look at the early history, history of partial discharge, um, it did get a bad reputation. It was based on technology that wasn't quite ready to be used for it. And it took some very specialized equipment and specialized training to be able to come up with a possible answer to it. The technology and our knowledge of partial discharge over the past 40 to 50 years has improved immensely. And it's become a lot easier to use the equipment. It's become far more accepted practice. And just through experiences, We've been able to categorize it a lot better. But what's happening is um, you have a conductor, an insulator, and a ground. And this is a could be a cross cut of a uh, cable for an example here. And if the insulation is not damaged, if there are no problems with it, it's basically a capacitor. And your applied voltage is evenly distributed across the capacitor and we get no current flow and everything is fine. And if the insulation is rated high enough to withstand the voltage applied, we have no current uh, being conducted. But if there's damage to that insulation, avoided with it, what happens is you get a series capacitive network developed where you've got a capacitor across that damaged area and a capacitor between the conductor and the, and the damaged area and between the damaged area and your ground. As the sine wave of your power system, the voltage increases with your sine wave. The voltage is evenly distributed across the three capacitors until it gets to a voltage level where the void can't withstand the, the applied voltage anymore, and it conducts, it arcs over. And it's microscopic, starts out very small, and you get small arcs happening here. But when that arc happens, the voltage across C2 here drops. The applied voltage is the same. So you have the voltage is being redistributed between C1 and C3 when the voltage drops across C2. But every time that happens, you get a change in voltage, you get, have to have a change in current. So you get a high frequency current pulse that goes through the insulation to ground. And that's one of the things we're, we're going to be looking for is this current pulse through the insulation caused by these little arcs, these partial discharges, occurring within the insulation, and we're going to look to detect that current pulse, usually up well into the megahertz range, so it's a very high frequency, low amplitude current pulse that we're looking for. The, the purpose of the insulation in 
uh, the electric uh, systems we're talking about is basically to evenly distribute the uh, equipotential lines or the potential electrical stress lines evenly across the insulation. So you get no concentrations of potential. <clears throat> and we can see up to six, six times of voltage drop across this, but the, these horizontal blue lines are potential lines that are being held evenly spaced, no concentrations. But if there's damage to that insulation, these potential lines are concentrated in that area. You get a higher electrical stress point around that damaged area. And as that happens, these potential lines build up. That's where our electrical potential builds, and we're able to start to get arcing occurring during that or across that void. And as that happens, on a microscopic level, the insulation gets broken down with each arc. So it's slowly being eroded away and expanding. And over time, the damage to this area is going to expand out to the point where the voltage is no longer being, it, being able to be withstood by the remaining insulation to get our flash. Um, so the activity is electrical discharges that do not completely bridge the electrodes. They're just happen, occurring within the insulation material. Material deterioration will eventually cause a failure of the insulation level over time. And based on the type of partial discharge it is, is how much time it will take. We'll look at different types of partial discharge, internal, surface, et cetera, and we'll see that their activity changes and that uh, their breakdown period will change. So type of partial discharge as it is occurring will directly correlate to the amount of time that's going to take for failure or how rapidly it progresses to failure. Um, the breakdown produces various side effects. You're, we're going to look at these, but you can see carbon treeing across the surface of materials. We can see corrosion on conductors nearby where the partial discharge is happening. We get this white ash building up on the insulation material. That's what the burning and breakdown of the insulation itself. And you can have heat. So you may see discoloration in the insulation in the area of partial discharge. What are the effects of it? Uh, damage is caused by mechanical breakdown, or ionic bombardment of the insulation, thermal. We are ha we have are having electrical arcs, small small in size, but they are electrical arcs. So there's a thermal component to it. You will have heating going on, and chemical. When the uh, chemical bonds of the insulation are being broken down, there are gases, different chemicals being released. Some of them are not as increased as others, and we'll look into a couple of them very shortly. Um, some of the byproducts of partial discharge, we have current developed, voltages um, in the electromagnetic spectrum. We get radio waves, RF frequencies being emitted, light. I've uh, seen in a couple of these slides where you could see the arcing across the surface of the insulator happening. Uh, that's typically very advanced um, where you can see it, but it, it, there are possibilities where you will see it. Heat's being created, so you see evidence of heat. You see discoloration of the insulation materials. Um, you may be able, to, in advanced stages, use an IR camera, an infrared camera, and see hot spots on the insulation happening. Okay. You may be able to actually hear it with your ears. I was at a paper mill uh, where just standing next to a, a section of switch gear, you can hear the buzzing of the discharge from the outside with the doors closed. That's going to be very advanced if you can hear it. It's a surface discharge typically, very advanced. Hopefully with our testing and test procedures that are going to be developed over time, uh, we're going to be able to address it well before it gets to that point 
and actually be able to do easy repairs as opposed to having to, having to do replacements for it failing on us. Ultrasonic, uh, typically 30 to 40 kilohertz range, but above the uh, ability of the year to year, uh, the arcing and all does put out very specific ultrasonic emissions. Um, it emits some gases, ozone gas. So if you go to a piece of switch gear and you open it up and you get a, a, an ozone uh, odor coming out of the gear, shouldn't be happening. It's a good indication that you have some level of partial discharge happening within the uh, that cubicle. And then nitrous oxide are also formed during the breakdown of the insulation. And nitrous oxides are circled in red because they actually cause physical insulation damage. And the heat's the obvious one. You can break down the insulation thermally. Uh, you may see the uh, jackets melting and deteriorating, uh, that ash forming that I've told you about from the insulation breaking down. But the nitrous oxides that are produced, they cause a unique problem. Because when they're produced, it's the gas that's emitted off of the insulator. And when nitrous oxide gases combine with water, they form nitric acid. So you've got these gases being produced, and when they combine with humidity in the air, it forms a nitrous, nitric acid on your gear, on your insulator. And as those acids settle on the gear, it can break the insulation down. When the insulation breaks down more, more PD occurs, so more gases are produced. And it starts to just escalate the feed on itself. That's why earlier we said it typically will start small, but it only gets worse because the progressive breakdown. As the insulation breaks down, the PD becomes more active and further breaks it down. So you get a cascading effect over time. We've got three primary classes of partial discharge, uh, corona discharge surface discharge, and internal discharge. Um, corona discharge is electrical discharge in air or a gas. It can be SF6 gas, it can be air on an air insulated switch gear. Most common place you'll see it is in transmission lines, on high voltage lines. So you have high voltage lines on the edges of the metal surfaces, charges build up, and you get this corroded discharge that just goes out into the air. It breaks the air down, but it's not significant of a concern because more air comes in and fills, fills in behind it. So you've got a, comp, a continuous breakdown of the insulating air and a replenishment of the air. Where corona becomes a problem is if this discharge is hitting a neighboring object, it could be neighboring metal, it could be neighboring insulator, breaking the insulator down. Now, medium voltage gear, corona discharge is a little more concerning because most medium voltage gear is designed not to have corona discharge occurring. It's the gaps between everything, and the electrical fields within it aren't great enough to typically have corona discharge in them. Uh, but it can be, in medium voltage gear, an indication of an early onset problem. And you can detect corona discharge in your medium voltage gear and upon inspection, see that you are having a breakdown that's going to eventually lead to partial discharge. So while it's not as critical as surface internal discharge in medium voltage equipment, it is a concern. It is something that if detected during testing, it should be noted for inspection in the future and monitored. Um, because it, it will uh, possibly develop into future partial discharge or it can be causing damage that will cause an outage in the future. So it's one of those things, medium voltage gear, it's, it's, you want to note it, you want to recognize it, and when you can, on a maintenance cycle, see if you can mitigate, clean up whatever the cause is. And, and we've got uh, some pictures of uh, some corona discharge uh, in medium voltage gear where you can see it's starting to break down to the point where partial discharge is going to start. So we've got an example. 
Surface discharge, as the name implies, is an electrical discharge across the surface of an insulator. So it's going to cause tracking, uh, typically called electrical treeing or carbon treeing, along the outer surface of a material, of an insulator. And this middle picture here is a good, very good example of it. This is that carbon treeing or, or uh, electrical treeing uh, developing, and it build up the carbon from the arcing and breaking down of the insulator itself. Uh, typically caused by a contaminant on the insulation um, of some form that starts arcing and it'll keep spreading out until one of these carbon trees reaches a ground point at which point that's going to arc over. Additionally, you can see on this, this bus bar section here, this green corrosion being formed. That is that a breakdown of the conductor caused by those nitrous oxide gases forming nitric acid and landing on the conductor. Uh, I think this one's aluminum. But you'll see green corrosion developing and rusting of the nuts at termination points. And that's a good indicator of places to look for partial discharge because you've got something that's causing that corrosion in that area. And one of the very one of the key locations can be partial discharge early on starting. Internal discharge, as the name implies, is a breakdown of the insulation in, inside. So you get a solid insulator. There's a defect or void within the insulation, has a lower voltage stand, and there's arcing happening within the insulation. This picture here is a cast resin CT current transformer uh, that was, they detected partial discharge on it, was able to identify which it was, took it out of service, sent it back to our forensics lab to say, to determine where, what, it was, what was happening, because this was so totally surrounded. You had no evidence, like this carbon train, that anything was happening. And a very specific test, which we'll talk about to detect it, but it was detected before it flashed over. And when they cut it open, they found this uh, valley eroded in the resin of the CT. And what we believe was, when it was manufactured, there was an air bubble within the resin. And over 17 years, the resin was broke down to this point where it was approaching failure. And doing periodic maintenance, they, they detected it uh, using a very specific test, identified it, was able to replace it. They were also able to determine that they've got a large lineup of gear that this was in. Many of these CTs, it was probably a one-off manufacturing failure as opposed to a common mode failure. So the fact that they weren't seeing any partial discharge in the other cubicles, they were able to justify just replacing that one CT and then monitor with annual testing looking for uh, partial discharge going forward. Basically, just pulling out what the different types of discharge are. Um, internal discharge, just a moment. as we said, is an internal breakdown of insulation. It can be oil. So inside an oil filled transformer, if there are gas bubbles formed, uh, those gas bubbles will build up electric charge and discharge. When they discharge, it burns the oil that's at the edge of that gas bubble, producing more gas. So you'll slowly have a development in an oil filled transformer from partial discharge uh, of the gases building up in there. And that's one of the reasons on oil fill transform, it's highly recommended to do dissolved gas analysis. There are very specific gases that are emitted when either the insulation around the winding is breaking down or the oil is breaking down from partial discharge. And when you do the spectral analysis on the oil, they're able to identify peaks in these very specific gases that are being emitted and identify a, a breakdown very early on. Now, internal partial discharge, uh, one, one very useful method of testing is transient earth voltage, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But it, it 
transient inertial voltage is produced during the breakdown of a solid insulator. So when we start, start talking about testing methods, one of them we're going to talk about is transient earth voltage test, which is capacitive coupled test. And that's indicative of an internal partial discharge. Another type of test is, uh, or surface discharge, as we've discussed, breakdown of the surface. One very good test for that is going to be ultrasonics. Ultrasonic testing is going to be listening for the arcing, very specific spectrums, etc. And it's a very quick, easy method to identify surface discharge. So we've got a couple of tests we're talking about. How to test for it, quick and easy. We're going to get into these more, uh, more in depth in a bit. And we're going to go look at different other methods also for, for detecting. But you have some very specific tests associated with types of discharge. Physical signs, um, as I said, smell of ozone. Um, when you open up a, a cabinet door, if you get the smell of ozone, uh, if you have vacuum bottle circuit breakers or you haven't had a, break, a breaker operate in a long time, you shouldn't smell ozone. If you get uh, air blast, old, uh, air blast type uh, circuit breakers, where you've got your arc chutes and it's an open chamber for the arc to happen when a breaker opens. If the breaker is open, you may get ozone from there. That's why I'm saying if you haven't had a breaker operation, you open a door and you smell ozone, it's a good indication that you have partial discharge happening. You get the smell of burning wire insulation uh, because that's where you have it breaking down. Uh, a metallic smell uh, from the breakdown. This color trails or lines along an insulation material and carbon tracking. This top picture here is a piece of an insulator bo uh, board that was in a, a lineup of switch gear. And you had one, ha one piece down here, they la labeled a ground that was touching, the, touching metal. And the other piece up here near the top of this picture that was very close to a conductor. And over time, partial discharge eroded and caused this carbon train to occur in this barrier board. Now, if you were to hold this up, these white areas, you could see, see light from extremely broken down. Something to note here, just to the left of my pointer, is a little sharpie circle drawn. That is about the width of a pencil, maybe a little narrower. And that's the distance that was left between these two car carbon trails electrical tree. And that was the insulation material that remained before this flashed over. So if these carbon trees touched, we would have had a solid conductor from our phase, our voltage source, to ground. And this would have caused a flashover. So this was detected and pulled out of service extremely close to a failure point. What's some of the benefits to testing? Um, partial discharge testing is becoming common relatively recently. Um, go back 10, 15 years, you would get partial discharge testing done on new transformers, typically new cables at the factory, but not field testing. As we'll see, there are a number of standards either in place or being developed for periodic maintenance using partial discharge testing. And some of the reasoning behind it is it's a good indication of early on, early on that you have a breakdown of insulation that's going to eventually lead to a failure. And if we're looking to improve reliability, if we've got a high profile location that is extremely costly for an outage to occur, being able to identify a problem early on is immensely beneficial. So we, we've done a lot of work with oil refineries and we hear numbers that if an oil refinery goes down, we're talking millions to tens of millions of dollars a day during the outage time because of lost pro production. And if we can identify problems 
and get them resolved before you have that hard failure, it helps your productivity. It, it helps in profitability for utilities. It helps your safety uh, numbers, your, your reliability numbers. If you're able to identify a problem early on and resolve it, or be prepared for the failure if, it, if you can't resolve it, so that when it fails, you can go in and rapidly repair. And one example of this is a UK utility undertook a two year of evaluation of online testing of their cables. They used uh, RF radio frequency or high frequency current transformers on their cables to detect partial discharge. They looked at 191 33 kV cables on their system. They went through, randomly tested these, and said, okay, based on levels, and there are standards out there for measurement levels of whether it's no problem, moderate, or severe. They classified them, um, and then they didn't do anything else. They just made note of these cables, identified them, and wanted to know over the next couple of years what would their failure rates be if they did nothing. Um, and really trying to identify, okay, if I'm detecting this stuff, how accurate is this to my failure points? And what they found was 84% 80 of the cables that they identified as had no problems, as good, had no problems within that two year period of time. So they didn't get a very high percentage of false negative numbers. Cables that were identified as not having a problem that failed in the future. They found that 21% of those cables that were identified as moderate levels failed within those two years. And over 40% of the cables that they considered severe failed within that two year period. So, what they were able to deduce from this was, yeah, when we identified it, within two, year, two years of us testing it, we had 61% of the cables identified as having problems actually fail within that period of time. Not, not a bad ratio if you're looking at ways to do preventative maintenance and, and institute a preventative maintenance plan. First thing you have to do is identify problems. And this, they were able to identify problems, and they were able to get some good solid evidence that once they identified the problems, those cables did fail within a reasonable period of time. But what it also shows is that you do have time to react. You don't have to necessarily take an immediate outage. You can plan how to mitigate this and have the least impact. So you can look at it and say, okay, we've got an outage planned within six months. Let's, we've identified it. Let's get our stuff in place. And during our outage, let's, let's fix these uh, cables that we're identifying as potentially having a problem. Uh, we've done a lot of work with some oil refineries. And they've had a lot of success with identifying problems and resolving them before um, failures. And what they found is different types of tests allow them to come in and do some testing ahead of their turnarounds and identify problem areas and coordinate their turnarounds a lot better than if they were to go in without any previous testing and try to identify all their problems during a one or two week shutdown period. So it does a number of things, allows you to manage outages well, it allows you to identify problems ahead of time and make plans for either resolving them or replacing the equipment early on before, as opposed to waiting till it fails and uh, trying to address it on a reactionary measure. You're doing a proactive replacement and keeping your reliability and your online time up. So, some of the history, theory, and, and dispelling, dispelling some of the myths. Uh, partial discharge testing in different forms has been around for 50 plus years. Um, I've talked to some people who were in the Navy 
who in the 70s, they were doing uh, partial discharge testing on ships and it, it may be installations. So it's been around for a while. Um, with the early equipment, it was basically RF radio frequency based uh, interference meters were used where they would basically put it on radio antennas near the equipment and they would try to detect RF, specific RF frequencies that are attributed to partial discharge. And based on intensity and the um, RF signals being picked up within the PD spectrum, they would listen and physically listen with headphones or a speaker for specific patterns to try to locate the source. Um, this type of testing required a lot of experience in identifying the patterns and the amplitude. It was subject to background noise. So if you had anything that was emitting RF noise in the vicinity, it tended to cause interference and give false positives. So you had to have a rather clean environment set up to test it. And that's where a lot of early testing of transformers and all-in labs were being done. You'd set up a Faraday cage so you wouldn't get any external RF interference. You're going with this type of equipment and you and you would test for radio frequencies being emitted by the transformer. Um, practicality of that in a lab environment is okay. Manufacturing floor is okay. In the field, that's not really all that practical. And it left a lot to the operator's interpretation. Well, the next iteration of the RS uh, radio, radio interference meters and all, they brought in spectrum analyzers and oscilloscopes, and they started connecting them to the de devices. And they used a uh, couple tunable filters and uh, capacitive networks to tune into the uh, resonant frequency of the cable or the device tested. And then using the uh, spectrum analyzer and the oscilloscopes, they would look for patterns. And you would see patterns like this picture here. And through experience and where these spikes were occurring on this spectrum, they would fine tune the equipment, try to filter stuff out. And once they think they had the best resolution, decide whether they think this may or may not be partial discharge. Um, it was very difficult to get consistent and repeatable results. Environmental changes could change it. Just uh, different things in the power uh, system could change and make the tuning very, very difficult. You had to be very precise with it. Uh, it was usually very large equipment requiring a panel truck or a van. And it typically had a mad scientist engineer in there. So you picture a mad scientist with the white lab coat, the pocket, pocket protector with pens and set of headphones with dial, two dials, tuning those capacitors and looking at the spectrum analyzer. So it was an extremely, extremely specialized field that had very specialized equipment. And in all honesty, it ended up with a result that there may be a problem here, there may not be. And it did find problems, but it also led to a lot of false positives. And partial discharge testing during this period of time got a bad rap because it was so specialized and you could run a test three times and you may get three different results. So it was very inconsistent and very difficult. So it took some extreme experience and knowledge to get a possible response out of it. Um, but it's part of the evolution. It's part of the data collecting that we did over the years. And we were able to build off of this information to get to where we are now. Um, for cables and all, and most insulators, DC high pot testing early on was, was accepted. It was, was a common method for checking for insulation breakdowns and shorts. Um, advantages of it, 
It was small, lightweight, portable, inexpensive, and pretty easy to use the equipment. Uh, you would set your voltage, uh, your potential voltages, you would run a test. If it didn't get any leakage current, any feedback current, that you passed the test. It was very good for the early laminated, uh, the lead impregnated paper, paper cables. Um, and most of the other equipment that was being tested. Uh, it was a good test for that. But when they came out with the more modern cables, the extruded cables, they found that it, was, it caused problems with them. And with the early on extruded cables, when you apply the DC test to them, it would pass the test, but there would be damage done to the insulation by the test. And what they ended up found, what ended up happening was they would test the cable, it would test fine, they'd put it back in service, and the cable would fail shortly thereafter. And we'll discuss in a couple slides what the phenomenon was briefly. But what they found was the DC test was actually breaking down on a molecular level the insulation material and actually causing a problem that it wasn't able to detect itself. So um, with the introduction of the extruded cables, uh, high pot testing for your cables and your gear has slowly gone by the wayside. What they also found was DC was blind to certain defects in both extruded and the, the paper lead cables. Now what they found was doing testing, so tried to do controlled environment, trying to repeat the tests on different types of cables. They inserted a needle into the insulation and they applied a DC voltage to it. And they applied different types. They've got the DC, they've got oscillating, uh, very low frequency, and they got 50 hertz or 60 hertz sine waves. And they looked at how many of each type of these tests with this type of a failure was able to be detected. And one thing they found was that DC testing didn't indicate problems in eight to ten, at eight to ten times nominal voltage levels. So on this 10 kV cable, they were putting uh, 80 to 100,000 volts on it, and it wasn't detecting problems that a 50 or 60 hertz detected at two times nominal, the VLF at three times nominal. So what they, were, they found was even if we didn't damage the cables, DC tests weren't as effective at detecting a problem. Um, so they went really looking for other options so that they can test extruded cables and try to get more consistent results. And that led us to AC testing. Um, now AC testing had some limitations to it. Um, if you want to apply a AC voltage at Rated voltages and above, you needed extremely large power sources if you were going to put it at 50 or 60 hertz. So what they came up with was a couple different tests using very low frequency. And what a very low frequency AC test does is it uses a frequency somewhere between 0.1 and 1 hertz, as opposed to 50 or 60 hertz power system frequency. It's no longer DC. And they found that by doing these low frequency tests, you don't have the damage that was done by DC high pot testing. Um, it does age, accelerate the aging conditions to cause existing weak spots to decay or fail uh, during testing time, not in service. And what they're able to do with these, and we'll look into it in a little bit, we'll get into these a little bit further, but they're able to do a voltage sweep. And they're able to apply not voltages increasing in steps until they actually see a PD breakdown. And once they know where that PD starts at, they can compare it to the operating voltage, your normal operating voltage, your nominal voltage. And if the 
voltage is well above your operating level, it's not a concern because you're you're never going to get to that point. If it's really close to your operating level, now that's where you want to identify some characteristics of it. Say, okay, my insulation, it's withstand voltage is now getting closer and closer to my actual operating voltage level, and I've got a problem that I've now got to address. So they're able to, with a smaller, relatively portable test set, and at low frequency, test at what point will partial discharge start at? What, at? At what voltage do I identify weak points in my insulation? Uh, it does not cause problems on the cable system like the DC does, just allows the op operator to identify them. So the DC test actually caused breakdowns. This just allows you to identify an existing problem. Uh, there are levels, voltage test levels, and durations that are defined by standards. So IEEE, uh, ANSI, and IEC all give you voltage levels uh, to do for testing. So you don't just randomly go in and say, okay, I'm going to put 10 times my uh, voltage on this cable on it. They define two, three, five times nominal voltage for X amount of time. If you don't see any breakdown, the cable passes. You can come back in a year or two and retest. So there are definitely standards out there, which we'll talk about a little bit coming up, that identify tests for your different voltage classes. Um, it's effective when used by construction crews as a substitute of DC high pot test. It's very similar equipment-wise to a DC high pot test. So it doesn't take an extreme amount of experience or training. It does take training, but it's not extreme like you used to have to do with spectrum analyzers and all to do the test. So it makes it practical for field testing. The test equipment is smaller in size based on the voltage level you need to apply. So typical medium voltage, it's going to be a portable unit. It's going to be something that a couple of guys can carry around and bring to a site. Um, it's effective as a withstand test to detect low and high resistive local defects in cables and, si and cable systems, uh, provided the proper test parameters are used. Uh, basically, it can be used as a go no go, go test. Set up a threshold. If my cable withstands two, two, one and a half to two times nominal vo rated voltage, we're good. I don't need to know that it's going to break down at five. Since it won't break down at two times my, my nominal voltage, I know I'm not, uh, I don't have to worry about it. So it gives you a good no go, go, go a go, no go test uh, threshold. And it can be effective as a monitor withstand test by measuring the leakage current or the dielectric loss factor. Um, you can monitor where your PD starts and fails. Okay, so you know where you are with respect to your operating voltages. Valuable to know. With the monitor systems, you can actually also detect location, and we'll get into this that in a little bit also. But it gives you the ability on a cable to determine where on that cable the PD is happening to help repair that cable. Another form of it is a tan delta test. Um, it uses a very similar test setup as the very low frequency, so it's a 0.1 to 1 hertz test. Uh, many times the tan delta test is an option in the very low frequency test set. Um, it accelerates the aging conditions, to cause weak, uh, existing weak spots to identify themselves during tested, testing, very similar to VLF, doesn't cause problems on the cables. And where it's different from VLF is um, in the VLF, you're actually looking for, for current pulses on the back as the architecture. What the Delta test is looking at is the leakage current. So it's almost like a power factor test where you're looking for the leakage current in the insulator. So if you had no leakage current, if you had a perfect insulation, it would all be, it would be purely capacitive and 
Well, if the current would be on the vertical line here as a capacitive current. But as the insulation breaks down, it becomes more resistive. And that resistive causes a leakage current to occur. On a purely failed cable, it's pure resistive, so your current would uh, plot purely on the horizontal here. But what the tan delta is looking at is the percentage of capacitive versus uh, resistive current, and that's your leakage current. And your, your loss angle is how resistive are you versus capacitive in that insulator. And that's a ratio you're going to look for during a tan delta test. Cable testing, equipment testing, uh, we'll hear a lot of times, um, I've got a brand new facility, it's only a couple of years old, I don't have to do any testing. Uh, I don't have to worry about that for 10 years. And that's really not the case. Um, we did some analysis of cable failures that came into our forensics lab and uh, basically did a comparison over time. And as you typically see, um, you end up with a different amount of failures over time. So pretty much anything that's out there, cars, whatever is produced, you get early on in, produ in, their, in their production life, you'll have failures. Once that's over care of or, or identified, midlife, they don't have any or have, they have a low number of failures, and then as they get older, the failure rate goes up again. That's what we found with cables, that you get an infant mortality spike, early life failure rate, and then at a certain period of time, the average failures drop down until you get to end of life of that component, whatever it is. And that's what we found here was um, that you define the infant mortality period of about the first 10 years. Um, and the infant mortality made, made up a lo very large segment of the failures that were returned to us. So early on, we were seeing at one year, eight cables going out near closer to five. We saw four cables in that range. As we got out, the number of failures in cable diminished until we got out around the end of life at 40 years, and then they started ramping up again. You get this traditional bathtub. But what we're trying to, I'm trying to point out here is just because a new installation doesn't mean that everything's good. And what we found doing some different studies, and we've done a couple papers on this, is that we get a lot of early life failures on cables, and it's a lot of times it's workmanship issues where the terminations are done improperly um, and they cause failures within the first couple of years. And it's a significant problem because we're, people got the appearance, well, it's all brand new equipment, I don't have to worry about it for a while, and they have failures happen. To the point we had one customer of ours had a large, large number of cables on the uh, facility that was about to go online uh, and they went through it and they tested all of their cables and brand new facility they had 30 percent of their fit cables fail on the test and when they went through they found termination problems on every one of them and they went through and re-terminated a few hundred cables just to make sure all the cables were done properly but they would have gone online and they would have quickly started having cable failures throughout their plan if they didn't do an early on test. So the idea or, um, yeah, I guess the idea that just because it's new, I'm not gonna have failures really doesn't play in in that you do see traditionally some failures in the first few years, they drop down for a while and then it comes back. So standards associated with partial discharge. 
There are a few of them. Uh, there, there are more coming. Um, the start of PG testing standards, the first edition was IEC 60270 in 1968. It really set the standards for DC high pot testing. Back in 68, most of the cable, cables were on lead impregnated uh, paper cables. So DC high pot testing was okay. Slowly they started to get into the extruded cables. Um, and the 60270 started addressing that in later editions. First edition of IEEE 400, uh, which was a guide for making high voltage tests on power cables and direct connected uh, voltage tests, was released in 1980. So that's first standards of starting to do the VLS testing. Um, and the, the that type of a testing for addressing the extruded cables started in 1980. Um, IEEE and ANSI released uh, the 400 series uh, standards uh, that give test that gives you very defined test standards for both offline and in 2019 they released standards or sorry. Uh, IEEE has not released their standard, but they're working on a standard for online testing. So the 400 series, the 400.123, and I believe .4, all address offline testing of the cables. They're, uh, they're working on, the uh, working committee is trying to get uh, a test the approval for online testing, which we'll talk about the difference between offline and online in a little bit. If you're looking, if you're in the IEEE in the U.S., you're going to be looking at the IEEE 400 series, and if you're in the European, it's the IEC 270 standards. ANSI, in conjunction with NIDA, released the MTS 2019 standards, uh, which added online testing to their offline testing. So now there's an online test and offline test standard, uh, and basically um, the offline test between the ANSI NIDA standard and the IEEE standard are fairly close together, they're fairly similar. Uh, the online test, um, one of the defining uh, points of the online test is they're looking for testing that occur every 12 months. So they recommend you test a year online every 12 months um, to, for reliability. The standard section 7.12345 address different types of online testing standards uh, for switch gear, transformers, inspection, Metal enclosed busways. So here are the standards that the NC need a MTS, uh, the actual section in that standard guide that call out partial discharge testing. Um, the IEC 60270 200 uh, addresses direction and connection only, defines the measurement circuits. The technique defines the calibration pulse generator that you use. So it goes into a lot of details on how you do your setup of your testing. Uh, that PD is measured in picocoulombs for the IEC standards, and it gives you the definition. So a picocoulomb is one microamp for one microsecond in time. So these are your standards based on what region you're in, you're going to want to go to to make sure you're doing your testing properly. What it's looking for uh, for internal partial discharge, uh, the picocoulomb, basically you have a current pulse going through your insulation, and it's going to look for that how many microamps per second are passing through here, and it's going to be related in picocoulombs. Cable testing as a standard identifies things in picocoulombs also, so that's one of the reasons I'm identifying it, just so you have an idea of what it is. It's 
the amount of charge over the amount of microamps that occur per microsecond. Some examples of the IEC and IEEE online test. Uh, you have capacitive couplers that connect up. You've got a, a voltage source. You've got a high voltage transformer, meters, you've got a calibration unit, and a coupling capacitor. And we'll look at these and see how they get connected and what the test results give you. But this is just some of the equipment that's uh, going to be used for the offline test. So methods of detecting partial discharge. <clears throat> I, I've used the terms a little bit. Now let's look into what they mean. Invasive, non-invasive. Uh, also online versus offline. Um, what are they? What do they mean? Well, invasive or offline testing. Um, it requires taking an outage to do the test. And, and effectively, this includes all direct connected test gear. So anything that you do a direct connection to, you have to take the system offline. You isolate the object that you're going to test. So if you're testing a bus bar, a circuit breaker section, or a cable, you've got to disconnect them from the power system, de-energize them, and totally dis disconnect them. Um, by definition, having to disconnect the cables, it's invasive. That's where that terminology has come from. Um, your BLF, your TAN delta are, are forms of it. Uh, they require the cable removed. Uh, BLF requires the cable removed from service. And we'll look at the connections in a bit. But you isolate the cables, connect your test set, sets up, and you run a test. One of the things with BLF or the TAN delta test, since you're using that 0.1 hertz as your common frequency, it's a long term test. So it could take two to three two to four hours to run your test. And over that time, you, you've got your low frequency, but you're creeping your voltage up. And to recognize or, or remember about partial discharge, it's a voltage-based phenomenon. Um, it does have some effect by current, because it, current will change the temperature of the insulator. But it's, it has to do with the voltage breakdown of the insulation. And you can have partial discharge occur on an open circuit breaker. The incoming side of that breaker has got voltage applied to it. It's got no load current since it's open. But you can have PD in that compartment because you've got source voltage coming on the inside of that circuit breaker. Half of that breaker is energized. The incoming cables are energized. So it's something to remember that you, 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 it's more it's voltage-based, not load-based. Um, and you're increasing your voltage on your test set for a long period of time. Um, sometimes based on the voltage level. So if you're testing a 265 kV cable or 265 kV ear, it may require equipment that's large enough that makes it have to be truck mounted. I've got an example of some smaller portable test sets that I think are good up, for, up to about 100,000 volts that are movable. It takes you guys to move them, but it's more portable than uh, a truck mounted system. So you have to know what your, what your voltage ratings are going to be and what voltage class you're looking at to make sure you get the right test equipment for it. Um, permanently installed systems and sensors need to be de-energized to install. So some of the systems, um, you can put temporary measurement systems on, devices, sensors in. Others, it may be more practical to permanently install them. So you're going to have capacitive coupling sensors that are going to go on bus bars, and it may go on, on your motors, on your generators. And it may be more practical to permanently install them and bring the test points out than it is to continuously disconnect, hook up the sensors, run your test, disconnect the sensors, and take them, put the system back to normal. So it may require some permanently installed sensors. Typical offline tests, 
high pot test, which we've talked about, uh, insulation resistance testing. So if you've ever done mega testing, that's an insulation resistance test. Similar to Tandel. Um, and, and that's one where if you've done the testing, you know you've got to de-energize the equipment, isolate, uh, isolate it off, and, and run your test sets on them. Uh, the VLF or Tandel the test set, same thing. And everything under the I, IEEE 400 and IEC 60270 are all offline tests by definition. The non-invasive tests, um, they're not known as non-outage online tests. Um, they're typically portable handheld instruments that use different technologies to identify PD without having to take the equipment offline. So it uses your, your utility, your source voltages. You don't have an external voltage source typically uh, to run the test. So it's run, running on your nominal voltage and, and you don't have to de-energize things typically to do your test. Some of the methods that are used are ultrasonic testing so you use a series of ultrasonic microphones to listen for PD activity across the surface of the gear. Transient earth voltage is a capacitive coupled test where you capacitive couple in the metal of the switch gear. And by capacitive coupling, you're measuring this phenomenon called transient earth voltage. And it's created when a solid insulator has partial discharge in it. And we'll look into this a little further. But you're able to see and measure this transient voltage when there is a breakdown of a solid input. RFCTs, HFCTs, or high frequency or radio frequency current transformers. Uh, typically, current transformer that has a high pass filter circuit in it. So it's filtering out the lower system frequencies, it's looking for high frequency currents that are in the PD spectrum. Um, they'll be attached to the cable ground straps typically, and we're looking for current pulses coming back down the shield or the ground strap of the cables. One note about the RFCT testing, while this is typically offline test, you do have to put these CTs around the ground shield. Typically it's a for CT, so it's a spring clip of some form, opens up, you can wrap them around this, the shield, put them on, where it becomes a, a little bit of uh, a challenge is a lot of policies, procedures don't allow you to reach into an energized compartment. So you have to have follow your company, your local policies with regards to what, how can I put these RFCTs around the shield. Uh, they can be permanently installed. There are a number of different options to remotely put them on, hot sticks, etc. But it is the one area in non-invasive online testing where your local policies, your local safety rules may dictate when you can install an RFCT onto, onto a, a cable. And then we have RF testing. Uh, that's come back. Um, much better filtering, much better uh, detection methods than the original one, but one of the phenomena that happens during PD is it emits RF signals. So whether it's service or internal, you get RF emissions that with antennas, you can pick it up. And by setting your frequencies of the antennas right, you can get outside of corona noise. You can get outside a lot of typical background noise you may have with other uh, test methods and get up in a, an upper frequency range, an 800 megahertz range that allows you to take and detect PD in high noise environments that you may not be able to do with other methods. So it, the RF testing has come back and, and it, it has some very very valid applications in different uh, locations. Surface discharge activity, uh, practical ways of detecting it. 
Um, one of the most common is ultrasonic testing. It's the easiest, most common method for being able to see surface discharge like we have here. Um, transient earth voltage, when you have very high amplitude surface discharge, you're going to get transient earth voltage also. But that's usually only very advanced. So you can do TEV testing, you can do the ultrasonic testing. R RFCT on cables, typically if it's on a termination, you can pick up, pick it up. Um, surface discharge. Not so much, really, it's not going to be that much in other areas. You can pick up a broad area, but if you have surface discharge, it's coming in contact with your shields, you'll pick it up with your RFCTs. And the RF detection so uh, it is very good, especially in noisy environments, for picking up uh, surface discharge. Internal discharge um, with switch gear, primarily one of the best methods is transient earth voltage detection. So it's going to be a passive coupled sensor onto the switch gear and you're going to pick up this transient earth voltage. You can also pick it up with RFCT, and since you, a lot of times you will get RF emissions during uh, internal discharge, RF antennas can pick it up also. So your three methods are transient earth voltage, RFCT, and RF antennas. Cable activity. Uh, your primary one is going to be RFCTs. Um, again, that's looking for pulses coming down the shield cable from within the cable. And you can detect failures on that shield coming down certain nations. So it doesn't have to be fan. There are ways using the RFCTs to get your terminations. Okay. Uh, RF detection near the terminations. So if it's near a termination, an RF antenna will pick it up. So if you have a 400 foot long cable and your PD is in the mid span on that cable, the, unless you get the RF antenna near the PD source, it's most likely not going to be able to pick up the RF. So RF is going to be good for identifying cable failures near your termination. Um, We've started to see the use of TEV detection on cables to help identify location. And what some of my coworkers have found is if you have a, a TEV sensor that's got locating capability, so typically it's going to have two sensors that are tied together, you go on the outer, outer section of the sheet, you can actually, based on time of flight between those TEV sensors, identify where on that cable the problem is. So one of the sensors is going to pick up the TEV pulse before another. So you're able to move down that cable and identify where on that cable the TEV, the, the, the pulses are coming from. So if the TEV has been found a good tool for locating it once you identify the cable with partial discharge on it. And ultrasonic, if it's very near the surface, or if it's at a termination, yeah, you can detect it. But if it's mid-span in the cable, you've got your, your outer sheets, you've got your layers of your cables that are wrapped around it, the ultrasonic doesn't have a clear path out. So you typically can't pick it up or it's so attenuated down, you're not going to get a good good detection of it mid-span cable. But it's very good on terminations and where the cables are exposed, where you can see them, for identifying location. Uh, why don't we take a moment and see if there are any questions? All right. Uh Tim, if you want to take a break from talking, I will uh, answer these questions. Sure. I have a chance to read them too. It's a long, long webinar.
Okay, the first question is, do you have a statistical percentage of PD cause for those reasons or failures? You know, of the 85%, what's uh, caused by termination and joint failures versus accessories? Um, no, I, I don't have any, the breakdown of that. We see a lot of cable termination failures, probably the highest percentage is cable termination failures, cable splice failures. Um, you see less in switch gear, but it depends on where the gear is uh, installed. So if you're near the coast, if you're down in the, uh, say Louisiana, Texas coastal region, you'll have a, a lot higher incidence of switch gear failures due to lack of cleaning than you would say in Alberta. Uh, if you're on the site of a chemical plant, you might have a higher one. Uh, if you're in a very clean, non-humid, non-salt environment, you might have a much higher cable failure rate than you would a uh, switch gear rate. So it, it varies, and I don't have any numbers. Uh, the next question is the reference for that 85%. Where do we get that? That is uh, a number that we have internally. Uh, EA Technology is a uh, test company. We've been testing... Uh, uh, systems for partial discharge for uh, 30 years, and that's just an internal number. I don't have a document I can point to. The next question was, can we say the capacitor which comprises the void happens to short circuit very instantly when we get an HF current there from the void to the electrode? So that refers back to that picture with the three capacitors in series. If you imagine the voltage evenly divided across those three capacitors, and when the center one, the, uh, the void, uh, has a flashover, has a discharge, that's gonna go to a very low voltage, and now you'll have to uh, equalize the voltage along the remaining two capacitors. In order to do that, you have get a high frequency current pulse right there until they're equalized. So yes, that's exactly what happens. Yeah, that picture there, so when C2, uh, collapses, you now have the full line voltage across C2, C1, and C3, and they are not uh, currently charged to that voltage. So in order to bring them to the right voltage, you have to flow current. And so you get a high frequency pulse, one polarity to the other, to equalize those. And once they're equalized, then the, the uh, current goes away. Um, question of service discharge will complete the circuit do we mean surface current completes the circuit through the surface to ground? Yes, but uh, again, because we're dealing with a discharge, it's not a DC current path or even a 60 hertz current path. It's a high frequency current path that exists only during the discharge. So when you get this discharge, if you look at that picture again, since it's on the surface, when C2 is collapsed, you have a discharge path. And then once the ionization goes away, then you no longer have a path to ground. But yes, the current does have to have somewhere to fly. Um, is the RFCT the same as the HFCT? Yes, it is, uh, and, and no, it isn't. <laughs> yeah, EA technology has in the past tended to use the RFCT as the same terminology as other manufacturers use HFCT, so it is the same thing. But we're actually coming out with a new model of the RFCT and we're calling it the HFCT, so we'll have both. Just minor differences between products. Uh, they, they perform the same function. Uh, there's a comment here that's not really a question, but uh, yes, when you're looking at the impact of partial discharge, it's not only the lost production numbers. Uh, these certain parts of refinery do not react well to loss of power. That's correct, you have not just lost production, but you can have risk of uh, explosion, personal damage, whether it's a hydrogen cracker as, as commented here, or whether it's just the electrical uh, devices failing, uh, and you can have arc flash and those sort of things. So there's, there's personal risks, there's equipment failure, there's lost production, uh, there could be environmental issues if you have a, a transformer that leaks oil. Uh, so there's a lot of different issues that can come as a result of a failure not just the lost production numbers. Uh, there's another question. With regard to VLF cable testing, would using the UltraTev Plus 2 with the RFCT connected to the shield return in conjunction with traditional VLF testing practices improve techniques? Well, the uh, RFCT uh, and, and the EA equipment 
such as the ultra tip plus two is designed to only work at power system frequency so either 50 hertz or 60 hertz it won't work at the vlf frequencies which are 0.1 hertz or 0.01 hertz the uh next question is will you share the slides and recording yes the slides uh we will distribute to all the registrants and the uh recording will be available probably tomorrow uh and then we'll put that on our youtube site where we have all our webinars and that link will go out as well the last question is uh is tv detection done by capacitive coupling that's correct so if you uh, assume your TEV test set is looking at voltage, you have uh, one lead, which is a, a capacitive plate, usually in the front of the instrument that's held against the, the device you're testing, whether it's the front of switch gear or the sheath of cable, but you're capacitively coupling into that gear itself. And then the other lead is typically this, this equipment has a conductive body and you know, the person holding the instrument forms a, uh, a capacitive sink, uh, much like an AM radio has, you know, so it's a voltage device, but still has one lead. Uh, so the, the voltmeter that is the TEV Pro consists of a capacitive clamp held up the, against the equipment and a conductive body that is, uh, you know, the human is forming the capacitive sink for the radio detection. Does anyone have any more questions they'd like to add uh, that we can answer now? Uh, once we're done here, you can add more questions over the next hour and a half, and we'll uh, answer those at the end. Okay, that looks like all the questions for now. Tim, I guess you're back up. Okay, thank you, guys. It definitely shows that you're paying attention, too. Uh, so good feedback, thank you. So we're going to look at it, go into, at this point, some direct connected uh, offline testing. And we'll start off with a very low frequency VLF test. It tends to be one of the most common tests that are being used um, in the industry right now as far as offline tests. And there, there are reasons for that. But <clears throat> um, basically, if we look at the equipment and the setup of it, uh, we've got a filter, we've got a coupling capacitor, We've got a high voltage source. And we got a connection to the cable under test and then a connection to the shield from the shield of the cable test to give us our return path. And <clears throat> within here, we'll see we've got a couple, coupling capacitor and measuring impedance in that circuit and then a measurement instrument that goes through there. And what it's going to do is it's going to apply a voltage to the, system, to the cable. If there's a defect, you're going to get the pulses coming through uh, the shield and back down. And by capacitive coupling across the conductor and the shield, we're able to do, take a measurement voltage between the capacitive coupling and the measuring impedance. So we're actually doing measurement here. And that's what we're looking for. If the voltage goes up and there's no problem with the cable, we won't get these pulse, this current pulse, which is then measured through capacitive coupling as a voltage. <clears throat> we can detect at what voltage this arcing happens. If I apply enough voltage to an insulator, it's going to arc, regardless of what its rating is. If I go enough above it, it's going to start to break down. So you don't want to go that high. You don't want to go 20, 30 times its rating. Uh, again, the IEEE and IEC standards all define voltage ranges for testing and recommended based on this voltage class, you want to go X, X, X amount x times nominal voltage um, typical numbers i've heard is somewhere between one and a half and three times nominal would be your your go no go test thresholds um, <clears throat> but what you're able to do is 
you're able to see this pulse that starts and you get a feedback loop, and that's valuable. We'll talk about them in a, in a minute. But what's also very important is you're ramping the voltage up, and you're telling your test set at 0.1 hertz to go to voltage level X. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to categorize the par partial discharge. And by that, you, you're finding the inception voltage, the PDIV, and the PDEV, the P partial discharge extinguish voltage. And where those numbers are valuable is you ramp your test set up and you see the partial discharge inception voltage start at 16 kV. You hold it and then you ramp it back down again and you identify where the partial discharge stops. So in this example, it starts at 16 kV and it ends at 13 kV. Well, my operating voltage is 11 kV. So what I'm able to deduce from here is I'm not going to start having any partial discharge until I get up to 16 kV. Well, that's well above my operating voltage based on what my switching criteria and studies have all shown me. I may only have a switching voltage that may go up to 12 and a half or 13 kV, which is still well below my 16 kV inception voltage. So it, I, I would consider this a good system. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to continue testing. It's a, above my operating voltages. I, I, at this point, I don't have to worry about it. I'll then go and test another cable. Over the years, these voltages are going to creep down with age. So my inception voltage and or my extinguished voltage may creep down. So as this aged, my inception voltage is at 16. My extinguished voltage is now down at 10 for my 11 kV. So I may have a switching voltage that would start PD at 16 kV, and I come back to my normal line voltage, and PD continues. I have continuous breakdown until I de-energize or I get below 10 kV. So that's why knowing the inception and extinguished voltages are valuable. It allows you to look at what your operating voltage is and determine, do I run the risk of starting PD and having it continue until I de-energize it potentially for years. And that allows me to say, okay, this cable is the, the start voltage and the extinguished voltages are too close too too close to my operating voltage level. I need to make a plan to replace this. And now start to put in, okay, since I'm, I'm relatively close on my numbers here, I can get away with doing it next year. Or if I find out ramping it up that my inception voltage is below my line voltage. My inception voltage was 10 kV. That tells me my insulation's broken down further. It's very advanced. And I've got high probability I'm gonna have a constant breakdown as long as my line is energized. So now that's more critical than one that may only have partial discharge momentarily or versus the long-term one. So it gives you some good information as to what my condition of my cable is. The other thing it's very good at is those voltage pulses or those pulses. If I am monitoring them, and I've got sensitive measurement instrumentation here, I can measure a difference in time here. I can also look at my applied voltage and my currents. And by impedances and line lengths and all that, I can calculate out location. So the offline test, uh, and primarily VLF, is very good that it allows you to take and locate where on the cable approximately your failure is. So now I know that on my 1300 foot cable, my PD source is 900 feet down from where I tested from. And I go out and start to inspect those cables in that area to make a repair of the cable, as opposed to having to replace the whole cable. So that's one area where the offline test is very good, is it allows you to do location. 
It also allows you to determine where in your operating voltage range your PD is happening and stopping at to make a, make a call as to what, how critical is this for me to address and re replace. There is a little controversy around VLF, just like there's a little controversy around almost all testing. And, and in short, what it's, the controversy is, is that you're not doing a test at normal, under normal conditions. You're doing a test at a, at a much lower frequency. Okay. And where the controversy comes up is you can get some bleed off from conductive coatings on whatever it is you're testing. So because of this bleed off, this um, current coming through the conductive coatings, it, it's some people don't consider it as effective in that it's less sensitive to some forms of PD. Um, fair amount of controversy over it. The vast majority of people um, say because of the benefits of having the smaller test set and being able to test more frequency, frequently, you have the ability to identify problems more often than the cost associated with being, bringing in a much larger power source that you would need to operate at 60 hertz. Um, so it, it's your trade-off, and it's typical with testing, is my trade-off is going to be I have to go to a lower frequency to be able to make it so that I can easily test my equipment. Yeah, there might be some limitations because of it, but there are four, far more benefits than me trying to bring in a 36 kV or 120 kV transformer that will allow me to test at 60 hertz and generate that much power as opposed to I need one six hundredth of the current capability to test at 0.1 hertz. So that, that's where the controversy is. That's where the pushback on VLF is coming in, is that, yeah, it's not testing at true system conditions. And a lot of your testing it has some of that compromise allowed. And it's been proven very successfully that while this is true, there are some forms of PD that you can't detect, you are going to be able to detect far more with this testing and save on outages far more frequency and increase your safety and reliability far more than you're going to lose by not doing a perfect test. Some examples or, or a look at some of the equipment. Uh, this is a van mounted VLF generator, so it's a higher voltage system, uh, probably up over 100 kV, where you've got your transformer because of its size, has to be very large to generate the current that you're going to need. Um, and you've got a, a generator in here, cables come out, you can see them coming out here to your. Uh, detectors filters and your, your uh, connections to your system here. So you hook up to your cables, your bus bar, whatever, that measurement filter, a capacitive coupler that allows you to connect up safely to it. You have your instrument, instrumentation off the picture here. This then comes out, connects up through this cable back to your test set. Smaller test sets are available, lower voltage capabilities. This is a, a portable test set we own. Combined, it's all about, it's about 500 pounds. It's packaged in a series of different crates. It's easily bro uh, broken down, a couple guys carrying it in. But total weight's about 500 pounds. Um, has to be dispatched. So you have to get it from your warehouse, your facility, out to your job site. So it's something to consider. Um, but far 
easier than the van mounted to get to a location um, to get your customer sites. TAN Delta testing um, is really looking at, as we've already discussed, the, the loss angle or dissipation factor, um, looking at the ratio of the capacitance to resistance of the cable and its insulation. So we're really looking at the ratio between how much capacitive and how much resistance there is in the insulation remaining. Um, perfect cable, there would be no IR, no resistive current flowing through it. But in real world, you always have some. And the critical part that was found was as the cable ages, you get more resistive current flowing and the ratio between the IC and the IR is critical in determining life. And that's how the tan delta is looking at, what the tan delta is looking at. Very similar to power factor. Anyone who's done any uh, power engineering, very similar looking at where your power factor is. So power factor rating on a transformer and all that, you're looking at very similar concepts. Uh, slightly different, but if you understand the one, you'll, you'll understand what the tan delta test is looking for. And you're really just looking at your leakage current from your conductor through your insulation. And that's what your IL is, your leakage current. Uh, typical tan delta, you've got some sort of a capacitive device, that, a coupling device that goes to your cable under test. Your return path is, again, your cable shield, very similar to your VLF test. A lot of times, the VLF test source has the option to do tan delta testing. So you get the option of doing it. So if it's not the exact same test set, it's a very similar test set. So size-wise, all that, it just doesn't give you as much capability as the VLF does in means of location in means of seeing what your inception and your extinguish voltages are. There's one of the reasons the VLF is, is a more common test now is it's similar equipment, but it gives you more data and gives you the ability to get a better feeling for what the condition of your cables are. So now we'll compare them to non-invasive or online uh, tests. Uh, surface discharge, as we said earlier, is ultrasonic. Um, now, you will be able to detect surface discharge with the VLF test set. You'll see the conducting of the of that carbon, of the arcing. It, you'll see it. You'll be able to detect it. Um, maybe a little different setup where you're going on a bus bar versus a the substation or not substation ground, the switchgear ground point, but it, it, it can be detected. You can put the voltage up and you can get the activity going. Um, one thing, your ultrasonic is going to be used, as I've said it before, for surface discharge. Surface discharge is influenced by the environment. So humidity plays a big factor in the amount of surface discharge you'll see. Uh, I was at a uh, facility where they had known partial discharge. We went in with the handheld instrument tested it, we found a section that had it, we were going to put a full-time monitoring system in. And when we installed the full-time monitoring, it monitors it 24-7, my engineers came back and said, hey, we got to do something immediately here. This is very high levels of surface discharge. And I went back to the facility and said, this is our mains coming in, we can't shut down. We de-energized the facility, it takes us a week to get back online by the time we clean out all of our stuff in process and all that. So this can't happen. And what we looked at was we had humidity monitors going also. And we saw that every time the humidity went above 60% humidity in that room, the ultrasonic readings went from 3 dB to over 30. So significant increase in activity. Anything over 20 is considered serious with ultrasonic testing. So and every time the humidity dropped below 60% humidity, the partial discharge activity dropped down to essentially none. So what we were able to do was 
we, our recommendation was if you put the humidifiers in that room and you keep the humidity level down, your partial discharge will stay down. You've got a planned outage coming in a year, and that's when their turnaround was going to happen in a year. If you keep that humidity down and you keep monitoring it, you're probably going to be able to make it without a failure to your outage. Since your policies don't allow you to open the gear up and inspect it to see what the problem is, it's hot, very active. This is one way you can mitigate it by controlling your humidity. So that's one, re one reason knowing during testing, whether it's offline, online, what your humidity is, is you can trend it and look at it going forward to see if it's changing with humidity. If, especially with the ultrasonic, if it changes with humidity, it's going to be partial discharge. Other things emit ultrasonic noise, bearings, lower motors, a lot of things create ultrasonic noise. There's certain characteristics of it that we're looking for for PD, and one of them is changing with humidity. So if you have high activity one day and you go back and it's down and the humidity is down, and you've noted your humidity and you see you see it trending that way, it gives you a, actually a, more information supporting the fact that it's all, that it's surface discharge. So noting your your environment, your temperature, your humidity help. Um, it has a very distinct crackling noise. So when you're doing ultrasonic, you're gonna have a set of headphones on. You're gonna be listening for ultrasonic emissions. Uh, they're often intermittent, particularly in early stages. Um, so you know it's gonna come and go. So you listen for this crackling noise. It sounds, some people refer to it just very similar to bacon frying in a pan, a popping and spitting. You ever seen the old Frankenstein movies, the Jacob's Ladders, the buzzing that's created by that? That's going to be similar to the sound that you're going to be listening for for surface discharge. Now, you're going to hear background noise, white noise, hissing. You may hear a bearing, a screeching noise. There's a lot of sounds you may hear on your ultrasonic microphones. But when you do find the partial discharge, it's very distinctive. And I've got an audio clip here. I'm not sure if it's going to play. I'm going to try it. Nope, didn't play. Um, my apologies. A lot of times with these webinars, the audios don't come through. So I do have to apologize for that. But it's a popping, spinning. Um, it's about 120 hertz, so two times system frequency. Somewhere in the range of what you're hearing when your transformers are buzzing. A dry type transformer vibrates at 120 hertz, expanding and tra contracting with your sine waves. So it expands and contracts twice a cycle. So if, trying to get you an idea of what the sound is or the range is, it's down around the vibration of the power system or about 120 hertz. Um, an example of the environmental factors I was talking about, the humidity. Uh, this is a graph of humidity versus ultrasonic, where you can see the red traces are humidity. Every time the humidity went up at this location, the ultrasonic went from almost nothing up to 15, getting up over 20 uh, dB for your level of uh, ultrasonic activity. Every time the humidity came down, the ultrasonic came down. So it does play a lot, the activity levels, with humidity. And what they found here was this was switch gear. They had a basement, a room underneath that had moisture problems. They had the dehumidifiers in there, and the dehumidifier failed underneath this section of gear. So in reality, they had low levels of PD, but they did have some PD. That when the humidity went up in the room below it, it came up in the gear, and it caused PD to intensify. Over a period of time, this PD level probably would have increased to the point where it would have been steady higher. But the humidity actually showed them that they had a problem. If I remember, it was two, two non-shielded cables close together. So they were able to separate the cables, pull them apart. That took, off, took away the PD source. And then they went and investigated the humidity problem. But that's just tying in together uh, your humidity versus your surface discharge activity. Uh, what most people are doing with ultrasonics, we're looking at a, an amplitude 
and saying at certain thresholds it's moderate or severe. And pretty much the standards are saying anything 10 dB or below with ultrasonic is not, nothing major or not no concern. Between 10 and 20 is moderate. You want to start monitoring and inspect it. Over 20, it's considered uh, severe or serious. And over 20, you may hear it with the naked ear. You may not need the ultrasonic microphones. But it's advised to inspect it and try to de determine how bad it is. One thing that cannot be determined by it, most PD test sets is if I have a value of, say, 30 dB, how long before I fail? What's my time frame? It's it's not that easy because yeah you have a lot of activity, it's strong activity, but you don't know how much insulation material you have left between where that activity is happening and the ground point. So that piece of barrier board that I showed earlier that had that piece that was about the size, the thickness of a pencil, that may have lasted a month. And it may have had the same reading that would have existed when that gap that was the size of a pencil was four inches wide still. It, 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 so you can't tell by amplitude how much time is related or how much time I have till failure because there's no way to really determine how much insulation material I have left. Visual inspections, that's what's going to give you an idea of how bad it is and how, how, how much time do you have based on the physical damage done to it. So that's one of the limitations we have. We can identify it, we can categorize it as significant or serious or moderate, but there's no one that's out there that can say based on just these type of measurements that you have X amount of time to failure. It will take more, more inspection. Now what you can do is you can increase your testing time. So you can increase your testing time from once a year to if you're seeing values between 11 and 20, increase your testing time to every six to nine months and trend it and see where you're coming. If you're staying level, it's not significant. If the numbers every time you test it are increasing and you're getting up to that 20 or you get over that 20 and you're reaching 30, and if you were to plot it, it almost turns into a parabolic curve. That's when it's becoming more serious, more activity, obviously more insulation breakdown. You need to move it up on your priority list for investigation and mitigation. Now, that may be, mean moving cables apart. It may mean putting a, a tape wrap and building an electrical stress cone like you used to do with the old cable termination around that area and reduce the electrical stress in there that's causing the PD. Um, it may mean a replacement of an insulator based on how damaged that insulator is. But it does mean if it's increasing, it's getting closer to failure point, so it needs more immediate attention. Different types of ultrasonics, uh, microphones that are built into the instruments, handheld wand type ones, parabolic dishes. They're very good for doing overhead insulators. So uh, insulators on your overhead power lines, checking the bushings and connections on uh, large transformers, okay? These have a range 150, 200 feet, very good for that. They're also very good for troubleshooting inside gear. So if you can open the gear up and you measure PD from outside, you can open it up and use this to narrow down the location. So it's very good with that. And then you've got contact sensors. And the reason for the contact sensor is all of the other sensors that I just pointed out all need an air path for the ultrasonic sound to come out. So your vents, your louvers, bolt holes, a lot of times I'll use a shutter for a remote racking on a breaker. That open that shutter up and I'm able to listen inside that section of gear. But it needs a path for the ultrasonic audio to come out. Modern arc resistant switch gear poses a problem in that it's sealed shut. By design, 
They've taken all the louvers and vents out. They've gasketed around all the doors. They've sealed that up so if an arc flash happens in there, it contains the pressure and the gases and the heat, and it's vented out through a series of chutes with flaps on it and chimneys. But unless those are activated, it's a sealed compartment, and it's intended to be. So you have no clean path out for ultrasonic sound. So you've got these contact sensors, which are extremely sensitive ultrasonic microphones that are designed to be attached to the metal. And it's got a, a micro, microphone disc in the middle here that's extremely sensitive, and they're designed to listen through the metal for the ultrasonic activity inside the gear. So basically, it's a way to detect surface discharge without having to de-energize your equipment. You're going to go through vents and louvers of your switch gear, or using power, the parabolic dish, checking your overhead insulators. And you're just going to go around and listen for the PD activity. Changes, you'll get sudden changes in sound, so just a white rushing noise, almost like a wind type sound. You may hear other rattles and noises that are happening until you get that, to that electrical sound that is PD. At which point you're going to slow down and try to find the highest concentration of that. You're then going to start to look for, on your instruments, other indicators based on the instrument. Some will just give you a go-no-go -no -go test. Yep, this may be partial discharge. Others, you'll have phase resolve plots. So it's going to plot the ultrasonic activity against the frequency. And you look for certain patterns to develop. And PD has a very distinct pattern that's happening near the peak voltage of every half cycle. So it's going to happen twice per cycle. So you're going to get clusters forming 180 degrees of plot part if you plot it against system frequency or against the sine wave. Where other types of noise, machine noise and all, will have different patterns. Machine noise, you'll see six vertical lines. So you're going to look on your instrument. You're going to look for those specific PD patterns. You're listening for PD sound. And if you've got uh, advanced instruments, they'll have algorithms in there that will actually tell you that it's PD. So it takes a lot of the guesswork out. Otherwise, you're going to look at a pulse per cycle count and your amplitude, and you're going to, going to go to a chart. And you're going to get check a chart, and it's going to tell you whether it's surface or internal, if it's noise, if it's something else, based on charts. So the instruments, and I've said, the technology has come a long ways. We've got algorithms that we've learned that we look for certain patterns, certain, certain characteristics that define PD versus other noises that are common in a substation. So your instruments are going to use these, and you're going to, as an operator, as a tester, use these to go through and detect the test. What's nice is this test is a couple minutes only, and two, three minutes on a section. Do front and rear, circuit breakers, cable section, uh, PT, CT compartments, anything you may have, it's just going to take a few minutes. And where that helps is if you're in a facility that you have a scheduled outage for, and you have a large number of cubicles that you have to worry about during your outage, um, you can come through online without taking an outage before your turnaround happens and test all your gear. You then identify sections of gear that have PD activity on. Once you do that, you can now manage your outage that, okay, I've got to concentrate on these five sections of gear as opposed to these 200 because these are the ones that I've seen activity on. So it allows you to manage your, your outage much better. TEV, um, it was identified over 30 years ago. Uh, we identified it, EA technology. Um, so we're proud of that. That's really what it got us into this, into transient or, or into PD testing. Um, it's got a measurement bandwidth between about two and 80 megahertz. It's got a, a very rapid pulse rise time, uh, somewhere around five nanoseconds, so very high frequency. So we're looking at 70 megahertz range, typically, is, the, is these pulses that I alluded to earlier. And what's happening is we get the current pulse coming through the 
insulator. So we've got our bus bar, we've got a uh, st uh, what am I doing like a, a insulated insulator here supporting it. And there's a problem in that. It's got a crack in it, it's got a void in it. So you get those current pulses passing through here down to the metal. Well, it's at a high frequency and a low amplitude, so it's not able to penetrate the metal to ground. Okay, so it's going to follow the skin of the metal of this switch gear. It's going to spread out in all directions. And it's going to find a path out, it's going to spread out and follow down the outside surface of the metal until it finds ground. And, and it's one of the things I had, when I first thought of this concept, I, I couldn't really grasp that it's evenly distributed across the metal. So it goes evenly across here. So it's going to be coming out in all directions. And in my mind, I was thinking a direct path to ground, shortest distance. But it does spread out evenly around there. And what we found was if you capacitive couple the surface of metal, through the capacitive coupling, you're able to measure those current pulses as a voltage pulse and a voltage amplitude. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking using a capacitive coupled voltmeter. That's how we're measuring those current paths. And when you're holding it, it's a specialized meter, you're making a capacitive couple path to ground by holding it. So you're able to measure these. And in reality, what we're looking at is a couple hundred millivolts, maybe one or two volts. So you're not exposing yourself to high voltages, not a safety issue, but we're able by capacitive coupling measure these. Now, if you remember, the VLF test has a capacitive coupler. It attaches to the equipment or to the cable. And that's basically what they're doing. They're capacitive coupling to the shield. And they're measuring these current pulses as a voltage on the instrument. And it's a form of TEV. Um, but that's what we're doing to do TEV measurements for looking for failures in solid insulators in your switch gear. There's another effect that's happening, I mentioned it earlier, is we get this EM wave happening too. So it's emitting an RF signal um, and that's gonna come out. And where that comes into effect is if the insulators are between two phases, your current path is gonna be up one bus far and back another. You don't have to pass the ground, but you get this EM pulse being emitted that hits the metal of the gear and does the same thing. And it's a transient earth voltage being created by that EM wave. So you're able to capacitive couple and measure it. So even if we, you don't have a direct path on a phase to ground that you have, and you have phase to phase, this RF signals, these electrical waves are being produced by it. That comes back into what I said earlier with the RF testing. You put RF sensors in here and detect any EM wave that those signals being produced. This is how you can do a test for a breakdown of a solid insulator on switch gear without taking anything offline. Again, modern instruments, good, good, good high quality instruments have algorithms in them now. Um, Older instruments, older technology, you're going to look at a pulse per cycle count, how many arcs are happening per cycle, and your amplitude, how strong the signal. And based on them, you're making a determination of whether it's internal, nothing significant, surface discharge, etc. And what they found is when categorizing it, if you have between 0.5 and 6 pulses per cycle, so 0.5 and 6 arcs per 16.67 milliseconds on a 60 hertz system, it's going to be considered internal discharge. Between 6 pulses and 30 pulses, it's surface discharge. Over 30, it's noise. And what's happening is, on your sine wave, you're hitting that inception voltage. 
which is usually get near your peak voltage. So you've got a really small period of time on your AC voltage window that you can have PD start, and then your sine wave goes down, you hit your peak voltage, and you go back down, head back down to zero, and the PD extinguishes again. So you've only got a couple milliseconds in time on each half cycle for those arcs to be happening. So for you to get 300 arcs during that two milliseconds of time on each side isn't very likely. It's got to be something noise related. It's not going to happen. So that's where these pulse per cycle counts come in, in the evaluation of partial discharges. How many arcs do I have happen per cycle? If it's too much, it's got to be external source. It can't be internal. Internal being PD on my insulation as opposed to a bearing noise, a machine, a blower, something that's not power system related, external to the power system. Again, fairly quick test. Press the instrument up against the switch gear so it's flat. The instrument has a capacitive coupler. Some instruments out there have capacitive couplers that can be permanently installed. So you would just hook up to, to their uh, test fitting. Um, and you're measuring for these current pulses. 15, 20 second tests, very quick tests. What we're looking for is, as we saw earlier, a breakdown in internal to a solid insulator. So you won't have typically a very visual indicator of it. It's going to be something that's hidden. So it, it, it's a good test. And I get asked quite frequently, well, what should I do? Inter uh, ultrasonic or TEV? Which test should I run? The answer is both because you're looking for different types of PD. And you may get a little bit of crossover. You may get TEV on, on if the surface discharge is very advanced. But they are trying to identify distinct types of failure within your gear. And you're trying to find an easy method to detect it, to know how bad of a problem you have, and when, when do I have to, uh, what do I have to do? This just goes through some of the differences between surface and internal, uh, the pulse per cycle count that I talked about. Often surface is audible, internal is not typically audible. Uh, internal is detected by TEV, and uh, surface is typically ultrasonic, and how to do it. Some other tests, corona cameras, uh, UV light. Um, they're handheld, can be remotely operated. They've got them out on uh, drones at this point for indoor and outdoor use. Typically, they have a screen, monitor, and what they're looking for is they're looking for a corona discharge. They're looking for the discharge into air. So you usually need a, a line of sight to the uh, object under test. They're very good at providing a precise location of discharge. So they're very good for overhead lines, open cubicles and all. They're good for that um, to, to identify the source. And what you get is a cloud type, and they could be color coded, image of discharge coming off your insulation. Um, they frequently have some level of an amplitude but one of the drawbacks to them is you do need a line of sight. If you've got a barrier board or a door, you're not going to be able to pick it up. Okay. So going into medium voltage switch gear, you're going to have to open doors up. It can help identify it if you see corona on it, another test. But typically, it's more for overhead. Or if you can't open doors, you can scan around in a cubicle. And you can see where the partial discharges are happening. You'll see large clusters of light light like this in those areas. So if it's surface discharge, if it's in an accessible area, it can give you a very good indication that you have where your location is. And that's the next thing. One is identifying it, two is locating it. Um, so they have benefits for there. 
and, and this, like I said, is a lot of times high voltage overhead lines uh, that are difficult to get up to. Uh, that may have a lot of background noise. Uh, the corona cameras are very good for that type of detection. UHF radio detection um, operates in the UF sp spectrum above 400 megahertz. Uh, uses antennas and sensors to detect the AMI emissions created by PD. Uh, the antennas can be directional or non-directional. Uh, and they've got inductive UHF sensors for cables, transformer tanks, and GIS systems. So this is an inductive one where it attaches to the metal of the GIS tank, um, and it's able to pick up the RF signals coming through that. Uh, this is a product that's a directional RF antenna uh, designed for outdoor switch gear where you can point it around and since it's a directional antenna, it can very clearly identify the exact location where it's, you're pointing it. So you're not just getting an emission from a uh, antenna that, yeah, I've got a problem here and walk around. This one, you can by passing it around and scanning the every insulator, every fitting, you can listening to and looking at the signal, identify exactly where that uh, PD is happening. An advantage, especially in high voltage applications to this type of uh, equipment is, many times you can take these antennas and you can tune them, what their frequency is. So we're saying it's above 400 megahertz. Corona rolls off at about 400 megahertz, between four and 600 megahertz. If you're able to take and tune your antenna, your receiver up, up, up above that, say at 800 megahertz, you could look for PD, because you're well within the PD, PD EMI spectrum of between three megahertz and one gigahertz. At 800 megahertz, you're well above that, well within that, but you're above corona. So any corona discharge you're having is filtered out and you're able to just pick up the partial discharge on your on your equipment. So it's very good in filtering out corona noise, something that isn't necessarily causing you a problem, and identifying a broken insulator, et cetera, in high corona noise environments like a transmission substation. Now, this technology being put into medium voltage switchgear, very beneficial. It can get above noise sources like dry type transformers. Dry type transformers vibrate at 120 hertz. They put out a lot of lower frequency uh, noise up into the, the kilohertz range. So your ultrasonic detection, as examples, typically set at around 30 to 40 uh, kilohertz. You can pick up a lot of noise from a dry type transformer, but an RF antenna is well above that noise level. So it's able to pick up partial discharge in a dry type transformer that's being emitted from the core and not have problems with the noise being generated by that transformer. If you have a location that has AC to DC converters, so data centers have a lot of AC to DC converters, they create a lot of noise. Again, in that kilohertz range, the RF antennas can get you above that and allow you to be able to detect partial discharge in those environments. Cable testing. <clears throat> A little background on what cable terminations and what uh, cable testing is, why it's done or why failures happen. Uh, cable, the design of a cable and the stress cones and the terminations have a lot to do with um, limiting the amount of electrical stress that exists in the cables. So we saw a slide earlier, and we're gonna see it in the next one, where the insulation is designed to keep those equipotential lines evenly dispersed. You don't allow them to concentrate. Well, the stress cones and the cones that are built around splices are designed to do the same thing. So they're not a mechanical stress release, like you would have on the end of a USB cable or other cables that you may see. They're actually designed, 
those cones are designed to take the potential lines and keep them evenly distributed at the terminations. And we're trying to, again, keep those potential lines, that electrical stress, from concentrating. So we want to keep them spread out like that and not concentrating like this at cable termination. And that's why that's done. And when you do a splice, you've got to cut back the layers. And the different layers are all designed to keep these spread out and not concentrate. Well, when you have cable failures, you get a point of high electrical stress built up in that cable, and it breaks down the insulation. So that's why we do our cable testing, and that's why we're able to do it on shielded cables around the shield. If you put an RFCT around the shield, that comes back to your measurement uh, device, and you're able to measure any current pulses that are going through the insulation back to the shield. So our offline tests, we're putting our uh, voltage source on the cable. Cable's isolated. We energize it. We got measurement circuit on the end of the shield that allows us to measure that. For online cable testing, we've got these RFCTs that go around the shield. We're using the system voltage, the energized cable, and looking for PD to occur and come back down. And it's a current transformer with special filters in it that allow us to look for that high frequency current pulses. You then have software or uh, measurement instruments that allow you to visualize or see the currents, measure them, get an amplitude of them, and determine if you have a bad cable. One of the phenomena that we get on that is we've got a direct current pulse that comes down, but it's a current divider. The shield is grounded at the remote end. So you have a current divider, so those pulses are actually going both directions. It's a high frequency. So when a high frequency signal hits a termination, some of it gets reflected back. So you get some reflection coming back down the cable. And you may be able to see the initial pulse and the reflected pulse based on time between those two. And the known length of the cable, you could determine an approximation of where on that cable the failure is. So you can gather some good information on where the failure is. Some of the standards for cable testing, um, what the acceptable range is and cables we're measuring a current, it's measured in picocoulombs. Based on the type of insulation material, there are thresholds on what's acceptable current pulses. And we can see here that a lead impregnated cable, paper cable, has a much higher current threshold that's acceptable than an XLPE. So they allow a lot more current to flow through the old lead paper, leaded paper cables than they find acceptable for the extruded cables. And these are standards, again, IEEE, IEC, and NITA have, uh, ANSI and NITA have these out. But we're looking at very low levels for XLPE cables. Higher level for the, term, for the accessories, the termination points, but still fairly low, especially when compared to the older lead line cables. So this is what we're looking for, and this is what the determination is. How much, how many picocoulombs are we seeing coming down those shields to determine that we have a bad cable? Some examples of cable uh, partial discharge, uh, electrical training in the insulation, voids, carbonization, uh, white ash formings, voids formed, obvious damage from a flash over to the screen, burn through, hole divot created in the cable. We got some pretty decent uh, erosion of the insulation here. 
and then erosion in the cable from PD itself. So long-term slow erosion of development through the cable. Here's an example of a failed cable uh, that was returned for analysis. And you can see the erosion of the insulation here. It flashed over, it failed. So you see the, the burning of the neighboring uh, phase. But when it was opened up and, and inspected, they found the semicon layer had this step in a cutback here. This is, as I said earlier, we see a lot of workmanship issues. This is an example of it. Basically, this should have been cut back smooth, nice and even cut back, like this one has. But when they cut it back, they allowed this step to be brought in here. And this semiconductor layer is designed to keep those potential lines evenly spread out. And this point was a point where it was allowed to bring those potential lines and concentrate them here, which created a high electrical stress point which caused PD to erode the insulation over time. And it eventually worked its way out of the uh, termination point and flashed over the ground, causing a, a failure of this cable. So that's when we said workmanship, and workmanship issues play back a lot into training and explanations and instruction manuals. Now, what does it mean to do, do a cutback? What does it mean to clean stuff? These are examples of where that wasn't understood or wasn't followed and resulted in a bad failure. And this, as soon as that cable is energized, you're going to start to see this PD develop. So this is one that would be an example of potentially an early life failure that would be detected on initial, initial, initial energization. So some of the tools and instruments used, <clears throat> we've got these instruments, whether it's uh, TAN Delta, VLF, um, online, offline instruments. We get all this data, and, and what are we going to look for? How are we going to analyze it? Well, two of the most critical pieces of data we have that we get, whether it's uh, through a VLF test or online testing, is the phase resolve plot and the waveform captures. And they are two key items that allow us to differentiate between noise, PD, or other sources. And basically what we're doing is we look at every bit of data, every one of those pulses we're picking up, we plot them. We plot them over 360 degrees, and we, we reference that to system frequency, 50 or 60 hertz. So this 360 degree plot is our sine wave. Okay. And partial discharge is usually going to happen near your peaks of your voltages. So what's going to happen is, if this is PD, if it's synchronous with the free system frequency or your voltage, you're going to get your data is going to collect 180 degrees apart. Typically you get two clusters, 180 degrees apart. And that's going to form part of our basis of our analysis is, is, are we seeing those clusters forming? Are we getting clear clusters? We then look at our waveforms. The waveforms are the arcs, those current pulses. And what we're going to see is they are going to typically have an extremely fast sudden rise time. They're going to be narrow in duration. You may get some capacitive ringing down, but it's going to be a very sudden increase, typically in one direction, and it's not going to be repeated. So this is a, a micro time scale in microseconds. So we got about 40 microsecond scale here. And we see a very sudden pulse that's not repeated. And if we get both of them, that's giving us a very true good indicator that, yes, this is going to be partial discharge. And with the phase resolve plot, this is why it's happening. It's happening in this range here as we approach our peak voltage. And then the voltage drops, as I said, and extinguishes. So really our time frame is a relatively narrow couple milliseconds on each half cycle. 
But if we synchronize when, when these are happening to the time, to the frequency, we get clusters 180 degrees apart. And this is a handheld instrument, phase resolve plot. And why I like this one is we get two clusters forming 180 degrees apart. But we've also got random, random scattering. This is background noise. And this is an ultrasonic plot. So you're going to have some background noise, but you see two defined clusters 180 degrees apart. The ultrasonic, you have your headphones on, you're listening for the sound. So you get the audio, you get the clusters, you got your two indications that you have PD. But we're, we also do that with the VLF test. We do the phase resolve plots with um, TEV and cable testing, the RFCTs. You're gathering these phase resolve plots, and they're one of your best indicators that, yes, this is synchronous to the power system. It's 60 hertz, and it's happening twice per cycle. So it's PD. Again, sunrise time. It's not repeated on your waveform. Okay, so it's in that very fast rise time, that's what you're looking for. We've got some examples of, of some noise, which we'll take a look at the waveforms and the phase resolve plots. Phase resolve plot off of a VLF test set. It's measuring everything in picocoulombs, but we're getting distinct clusters one bridging between 0 and 360, so it's really going between 320 degrees and 40, and one between, oh, what's that, about 135 degrees and 200, but we've got distinct co concentration 180 degrees apart. And that's, again, one of the things on the VLF test sets we're going to be looking at is, yep, we've got our amplitudes, we've got everything else, Look at our display, look at our data. Do we have these clusters 180 degrees apart? Non-PD patterns, random noise, and scattered randomly. No clusters really forming. Uh, positive and negative amplitudes. And no sudden rise times. Repeated signals. So this is all noise. You may see something like this, vertical lines. Yeah, these two are 180 degrees apart. We got three sets 180 degrees apart. What these vertical lines are, they're not that cloud cluster. This is machine noise. So VLF, a motor noise, three-phase motor. And this is the PD being produced by the motor itself. Three phases. Two half cycles, you get that. You look at the waveform, it's sinusoidal. It's definitely not PD. Now, if you had PD, you may see two clusters forming within these vertical lines. So, yeah, you have a machine and you got, you're testing a cable that has a machine attached to it. I've got PD on the cable and my load's machine. So, you can have both. <clears throat> but if you just see this vertical three line, Six vertical lines or six clusters evenly spaced at about uh, 60 degrees, that's going to be an indication of machine noise. So that's what we're looking for when we're evaluating the data and what patterns we're looking for. Uh, corona noise is unique in that with corona, you'll just get a single cluster of data. Typically, only happens during one half cycle. It's a charge, and you'll just see a single cluster of data. You won't have the two two clusters. I said earlier, if you have a medium voltage, if you identify corona, you want to pay uh, you want to pay attention to it, but it's not as critical. Well, that's the way you identify it. It'll have a sound that's a little deeper than PD, and you'll get single clusters forming. And we've got an example of that coming up. But that's one where I would. Identify that section for future tests and just to monitor and identify, keep an eye out on it. If it de energizes, go in and see if you can find some evidence, some of that ash building up, some discoloration, et cetera. For the online instruments, uh, we've got 
some classification of them. Basically, a level one instrument considered a no go, a go no go testing. Um, may have audio, so you can listen for it. You have red and green indicators, or maybe red, yellow, green. That'll tell, just give you a yes, I have ultrasonic or TEV, or no, I don't. You don't get amplitudes typically off of them. It's a basic instrument, good for a line man, good for safety inspections. If I'm entering a room, if I'm going, going to be near gear, I can just do a quick 10, 20 second test on the gear from the outside and say, okay, in the area I'm working on, I've got nothing that has, that has any possibility of PD in it. Um, so good for safety inspections uh, for entering facilities and all. Um, it helps identify areas that may need greater inspection and testing. Limitations of it is you may get false positives. It's just a go-no-go no go test. You don't get the phase resolve plots. You don't get the waveforms. So you could have external noise sources that may give you ultrasonic. So it may give you some false negatives, but it does give you an ability to identify something uh, ahead of time. Level two goes up a level, obviously. It gives you amplitudes, our pulse per cycle count, our phase resolve plots, our waveform captures. It gives us all the data we need to accurately determine not only the presence of PD, but how bad it is. What, what is its severity? Okay. Typically, it's going to allow you to do multiple tests, your TEV, your ultrasonic, cable, UHF, um, it gives you your amplitude. So, so it's got recording capabilities. So you can do your, your annual testing with a level two instrument. It collects the data, typically all your waveforms, all your measurements you're taking, it'll collect that data and allow you to do recording off of it, allow you to do your trending and compare it to previous results. Where the level ones just say, yeah, I see something, no, I don't see something, and doesn't define what something is. This gives you something defined in a manner that can be compared, and you can start to do trending. And that's going to be one of your uh, best tools of being able to trend over time your levels of PD. So just a comparison between the two. Level one is easy to perform, typically fast. Minimal knowledge of PD required. Um, it just, you, you, you may have it or you may not have it. I don't have to be able to look at it and say, yeah, it's high level or low level. Um, inexpensive. It's ideal as a, for a safety program where you want to just be able to go in and quickly identify if there may be a problem while doing other work in, in that uh, location. Uh, you, can't, you can't compare previous results. It's subject to false positives from noise. Uh, will re typically require a follow-up testing on level one. And it's limited in number of functions. As compared to two, multiple functions, a lot of stuff we've already d discussed. Um, now, the next level up is our full is full-time monitoring. So the online tests, the instruments what I just talked about, the level one and level two are all, all, uh, are all online. Use system voltage and frequency for their voltage levels. One thing it's not telling you that the offline test is the inception and the extinguish voltage. But if you go in there and you have PD at your nominal voltage level, the extinguish and, and inception voltage don't care, count that much anymore because it's there now. You know it's there. You know it's present during your normal operating system, so it's more of a concern. It's already in your operating range. But those instruments are spot checks. You go in, you get readings when you test it. You leave, you have to come back and retest again. There's a set of instruments out there that do provide full-time monitoring. And they get attached to the equipment and they will collect the data 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
And there are different types of equipment, different levels, where it can be attached to the outside of the switch gear, so you don't have to open up the switch gear to attach it and start your monitoring. There is equipment that has internal uh, equipment permanently installed. But where it's very beneficial is it's providing that full-time monitoring. It allows you to monitor the system over long periods of time easily. It's always collecting the data for you. It's also allowing you to collect other information like temperature and humidity. You can measure the temperature of the individual cubicles. Um, some of them have attachments for measuring temperature on bus bars, etc. So you can bring a lot of sensors in and monitoring monitor the system full time and now trend it. So you can slowly see it building up over time and see changes over time and get get a good feeling of how severe is it, how how progressive, how much has it progressed um, based on this information. Different types of couplers and sensors, some of them permanently installed, so they attach to your bus bars, leads coming off of them. They can clip on, slip around like the RFCTs. Um, You've got voltage detector, detectors that can be attached. Any number of different sensors that can be applied within the switch gear. Or you've got magnetic ones. So here's a magnetic one. That, these two are both magnetic. This one's ultrasonic. This is TEV sensor. That can be attached outside or temporarily and moved around the location. So when doing monitoring, you got to know what you want to do. Do I want to monitor a section of gear for three months and then move on to another one? Or is this a real critical circuit for me that I need to make sure I'm monitoring at all time? Because if this shuts down, I'm going to shut down half the politicians in my town. I just don't want to listen to them. Or I'm shutting down a critical part of my refinery that will become dangerous if we lose power. Those are the ones that keep me up at night. What happens on those circuits? Well, if it's a circuit that's going to keep you up at night, you probably want to put a full-time monitor on it as opposed to, to doing spot check. And what they allow you to do is use a series of different sensors simultaneously monitor your surface discharge, your internal discharge, cable, ultra, ultra high frequency, the RF signals, temperature, humidity, load current, system voltage and frequency, and tie it all into a, a common point, bringing it back to your central office, your SCADA, et cetera. And it allows you to give have a good long time running plot and trend of your system. So it definitely has some benefits on high profile circuits over doing spot monitoring or spot checking. There's more cost associated with it. So a lot of times putting out every circuit you have may not be better you may not see a benefit to that. But if in your facility, if you have circuits that are definitely critical to you and that truly keep you up at night, you then may want to consider either very frequent spot checking with the handheld instruments or going to a full-time monitoring system. And what this allows you to do is by putting multiple sensors on all the gear, all the cubicles, you can get information like which sensor sees the data first. So I got 13 sections of gear, I've got 13 TEV sensors, I can determine which sensor is seeing the pulse first because it's going to spread out across all of them. And that's going to allow me to deduce what cubicle has my problem in it, the one that's connected to that TEV sensor. So I can very quickly identify where my problem is. Uh, one of the paper mills I did, I could hear the PD from the outside. I went down and measured every cubicle. And when I put it on a plot in a chart, I was actually able to see the amplitudes increasing on each section until I got to the one that was making the buzz coming out of it, and they dropped as I went down. That's with amplitude. If the monitor is the right piece of equipment, it actually synchronizes each of the sensors. And based on time of flight, it can tell which sensor sees it first and give you a report this sensor sees the, the TEV pulse first 
99% of the time. You automatically know whatever cubicle that sensor is mounted to is the one that is closest to the source. So you've been able to clearly identify, A, you've got it, what its amplitude is, how it's built up over time, so I can trend how bad is it getting, and I can determine which cubicle my source is coming from, which allows you to go in and repair it that much easier. Typically, they should be easy to expand the system. So as requirements grow, as circuits become more critical, or you add circuits, you may have spare breakers that get put in the service, it should be easy to build, add on to it. Um, and it should be somewhat intuitive to use. Some of the benefits, um, as I mentioned earlier, you can see where the ultrasonic increases with humidity and noise. And you can trend that over months and see that over time, whether it's days, weeks, or times. It gives you a good indication. You can also, over time, look at the trend on the pulse per cycle count or the trend on its amplitude. And on this one here, you can see it stays low, it stays low, and then it starts to ramp up. And you've got some that are staying low, some that are ramping up. So you can see that parabolic curve I mentioned earlier over time. You can see a ramp up and say, hey, I'm no longer staying steady, I'm increasing. Or at this point in time, I started having PD, it's staying somewhat steady here. And that looks like it's over a couple weeks, October 2nd to October 16th. So it's staying somewhat steady, but at some point this is gonna ramp up also. So it gives you that data and gives you the ability to trend over time Give yourself an idea of how severe my problems are. It gives you full time, gives you better ability to better assess the condition on critical circuits, and at any time look at it and see if it's getting worse. Or if you're doing periodic, you have to send someone out, take the every time, whether it's monthly, six months and develop the database, develop your charts to see how it's trending. So it gives you a lot of flexibility on where you're going, what you're doing, a lot more visibility to your system. Now a decision has to be made is what circuits require it, what circuits are the ones that I need to put this on, knowing I can build out on it or I can trend using periodic testing. One of the biggest things is getting a testing system in place. Partial discharge testing has come a long way and gives you a good early indicator. If you're doing periodic testing, if you're doing it every year, you will be able to have months, if not years, of time to plan for it. It's not going to be typically a sudden, I have to take this down tomorrow and do an emergency repair. So it gives you time to plot it, trend it, monitor it, and make a mitigation plan. And that mitigation plan may be, I have to run this to failure, but I at least know what my problem is now, and I can have that equipment on hand for when it fails or I know I've got an outage on that area of my facility coming up in three months, I need to add this to my work orders for that outage time, as opposed to just going through and guessing. So we've done our tests, we've got information, I'm, I'm being told I've got PD and I gotta come out now and fix it. What am I gonna be looking for? Well, we got some examples of PD. Um, starting out, uh, we've got some surface discharge. Barrier bar, contamination on it, maybe kind of a little too close to, close to the bus bar, got a lower voltage potential since it is grounded, and over time, the insulation on this bus bar. 
that PD and broke down. Here's that white ash I was referring to that you want to look for. That's an indication of surface discharge. You can see some discoloration in here around the insulation from the heat. So that's what you're looking for is physical breakdown and residue, whether it's color, whether it's ash, whether it's carbon tree. Uh, this is a good, very good example we like to give. Uh, this was detected with a 24-hour monitoring system. There's the ultrasonic microphones. Um, this I would put to a design problem. And what happened was we've got unshielded cables coming off the PTs, 13 kV system. They were wire tied to these insulator blocks. Well, what was happening with it was where the non-shielded cable was hit in the corner of that insulator block, you had a high electrical stress point. You have those potential lines being evenly distributed by the shield, by the insulation in the cables. You've got this insulator bar that's of a lower potential. And everywhere those cables touched this insulator block create a high potential that developed PD. Now, this gear was seven years old when they identified this. They just put the monitors in. They ran it for a couple months. And all of a sudden, they saw ultrasonic activity going up in almost all their cubicles. And when they went and inspected, they found these burn marks on the insulation on every cable. So they had two sections of gear. Each, each section of gear had uh, about 14 cubicles. And every one of them had damage, the damaged cables in it. And these cables were tied at three locations in the switchgear to one of these insulator bars. And the cables had burn marks in every, on every single one at the same spot on every one. They called the manufacturer. Hey, we got a problem. Manufacturer, there's no problem. Seven years old. Didn't fail. There's no design problem here. But over time, the electrical tree would have started on this insulator bar and would have continued as this insulation broke down on the cable. We would have had our uh, electrical tree that probably would have led to a flashover. Or the insulation would have broken down to the point where something would have come in close contact with it and caused a flashover. Because this insulation is compromised and it's going to continue to break down. This is a very high profile building outside of DC, um, government building that if they lost power, it, it would have been a very severe problem. So it was considered a high profile, high, uh, critical, high critical location. And you can see on the plot that in three months, the activity picked up and continued to pick up. So, this clued them in, and here are those cables where I told you there were score marks on every one of them. And this is a close-up. You can see it's a non-shielded cable. They went in, they replaced the cables, and at the contact points, they did a uh, tape cone, stress cone, similar to an old-fashioned uh, stress buildup on a, on a cable termination at all the contact points to help spread out the, that electrical stress, they put stress cones basically at all the contact points. And so far, it's been about three years since they've done that. They've had no problems. Uh, and obviously, they keep an eye out for it. Something else they found in the same gear was they had one, one of the monitors started indicating transient earth voltage in the compartment. They went in and they inspected. They saw that this termination was bad. And you can see when they cut it back, the grease goop that's designed to help spread out those potentials at the cutbacks wasn't evenly distributed. And you can see a dry spot right there. And that was your PD source. And that created a, a, a stress point that broke down the insulation in the cable and created TEV that they were able to de uh, detect. So they ended up in having to re-terminate that cable. Some more cables. Um, these cables 
the shield was cut back on them, but it was cut back too low. And you can see the cables are coming in of different phases, coming into close proximity in an area that's not shielded. Created an electrical stress point between them, and there's that white ash phase of the breakdown of the insulation. Over time, this would have flashed face to face. Very similar to this cable up here. This one, we'll take a better look at. <clears throat> Stress cones, they didn't have the right voltage rating. Stress cones, so they put a larger stress cone on it. So they went up a voltage rating. Shouldn't be a problem. But it's a non-shielded section of the cable, and it actually caused the stress cones to come in contact with each other. So it created a high electrical stress point in the contact points. If you look closely, you can see the white ash forming, the carbon treeing happening on the stress boots going in both directions. You can see there's a little more of an air gap between these two. So they've only got a little bit compared to these two phases. Something else to note is this rusting on this rear panel. Sealed compartments, they're outdoor compartments, no obvious evidence of water getting in there. So no leaks, but rust was forming on this back panel. That was that nitrous oxide gases being emitted, forming nitric acid and condensing on the metal panel here and caused the corrosion. So if you ever, ever open a compartment and you see rust clouds on metal and there's no obvious examples or reasons for there to be rust forming in there, a leak in the ca cabinet or anything like that, you need to take a close look at what's around it because there may be PD and that might be formed by that nitric acid uh, condensing on the metal. So another visual indicator of PD. Uh, piece of switch gear, heavy, heavy surface discharge, heavy carbon buildup. This is one of the islands, so surrounded by salt and high humidity. Um, they've got known moisture problems, they've got water cooling, almost filling up the bottom of their switch gear. Uh, it's an island. It's all sand. It all perks in, goes through the concrete. There's nothing they can do about it. This is a normal test for them. They go through and they regularly find this. And this is a almost annual replacement where they replace these. And it's normal maintenance for them. They use the uh, handheld instruments to identify them, and they just go in and replace it. If this was back on the mainland here, in a substation here, this would cause people to freak out because you shouldn't see this, this level of PD build up in short periods of time, but it's the environment they're in. There's nothing they can do about it. So they just have a warehouse replacement parts and they just regularly go through and replace them. We've seen this uh, cast resin CT before. Uh, surface discharge in a roof mounted transformer. They identified it with ultrasonics. They went in with the parabolic dish and they scanned everything. And the parabolic dish picked up the most signal behind this flange. Remember earlier I said those parabolic dishes are great for troubleshooting. When they pulled this flange off, they found that the hole wasn't cut clean. It was a jagged piece of metal pointing towards the conductor. It started to cause PD to happen. In all likelihood, if they didn't identify it using the parabolic dish behind that flange, they would have checked the terminations, they would have pulled the elbows off, checked them, cleaned them up, maybe put a little, new, little more grease in there, and they would have found the source. So that's where that parabolic dish worked out to be an excellent test set instrument. Uh, two separate phases pulled through a conduit, cables were crossed causing different phases to be pulled through this common conduit, and partial discharge to develop between the two phases. Over time, this would have caused a failure. Some cables, failures, 11 kV cable, one hour old. It was energized for one whole hour, and it fa failed at a branch adapter, a splice point. When it was cut open and investigated. Some of the things they found, 
workmanship, only one shear, shear bolt was coming in contact with the connect, conductor. So the conductor wasn't pushed in far enough for both shear bolts to make contact. No putty in the shear bolts. That putty helps uh, mitigate the electrical stress at the shear bolt points. They also should be cleaned up and no jagged edges. Poorly cut too. So you can see that jagged edge here on the cutback. And the gap in the insulation was cut back too far. It's 30 millimeters. That shouldn't be cut back that far. So this cable was bound to fail. When we opened it up, we found these five different workmanship issues that would have led to a failure in and of themselves. And it failed in under an hour. Another cable, 18 month failure uh, at a, loca a joint location, common joint. Very common pattern for midpoint failure, this divot, blowout point at your failure point. What they found, uh, they didn't deburr the shear bolt, so there was a sharp edge on the shear bolt, which was most likely primary cause. But when they cut back the layers and looked at it, they also found sand in the joint. They didn't remove the furrowing from when they removed the semicon layers from the insulation. And all these are electrical stress points. They all have different electrical withstand levels and create electrical stress points. So any one of these would have led to a failure. And some of the things we've looked at, we've looked into, we've looked in instruction manuals for terminations, and they tend to be vague. They say clean the joint. What does that mean? Just wipe it down with alcohol? Make sure there's no grease or fingerprints on it? Make sure there's no sand in the joint? Sand all burrs off? What does clean the insulation before you put the boot on mean? And that's some of the limitations we're seeing is in workmanship, it's not clear what to do. Uh, 28 years old, cable failed midpoint. Um, Mechanical damage to the sheath. And when it was opened up, we saw some electrical treen, some water treen. So otherwise, the cable was good, but it looks like it was damaged and allowed water to get in that eventually learned, uh, developed in the PD. And our final one 47 year old cable, mid cable failure. Basically, when it was cut open, there was no evidence of bad workmanship, no problems. It failed because of age after 47 years. Uh, not a bad lifespan, what would be more than acceptable. But one thing to point out, if they would have been doing the partial discharge testing, probably could have prevented the unfailed outage. It would have detected the carbon treeing happening there. It would have given an indication that the cable was nearing end of life, was developing problems, was getting worse, and was time to replace it. And that's it. That's all of it. Um, open it up again to questions and want to thank you guys for your time. I hope you found uh, some value in this. Bill? Okay, Tim, I'll, uh, I'll address these questions again. And then when I'm done, you probably want to explain to everyone how the, uh, the quiz works uh, for uh, the CPD credits. So the, uh, the, the first question is, it says the ultrasonic survey requires some experience on judging conditions and sound types and amplitude, is it? Um, it depends on the instrument you're using. If you're using just a generic ultrasonic uh, survey instrument, it does take quite a bit of experience and a calibrated ear. Uh, more modern uh, specialized equipment will give you a phase resolve plot as Tim talked about, and that is very helpful. Uh, it'll, it'll get, might have algorithms that'll built in that can tell the difference between PD and noise. And, uh, those sort of things will make it less, uh, experience related. Experience always helps, but if you have an algorithm that's telling you it's PD, you know, a phase resolve plot that's telling you it's PD, and from your experience hearing the sound, sounds like PD, that's going to be a lot easier than if you're just listening. 
what do we, the next question is, what do we do when there's a switching near or far to the switch gear under test with ultrasound testing? Well, you really don't want much going on in the power system when you're doing the testing. Now, a switching, because it's such a short duration thing, you might hear a pop or a click or a, a short burst, but you're not gonna, it's not gonna affect uh, the reading for very long. So if you're seeing something, make sure it settles down before you take a uh, reading. You wanna take a, a steady, a, uh, you know, an instantaneous reading. All right. Um, can we conclude in general, the severity of, pe of PD is a measure of amplitude of the charge release and the number of PD events? Um, yeah, we, we actually use the term severity for a mathematical combination of the two, but you do need to be aware that with things like ultrasonic, uh, the level is not necessarily directly related to the severity because you're listening to sound and there could be something in the way of the sound. You, you know, the, if you put something in front of your mouth, the sound level goes down. So you want to look at it over time and trend these things to see, is it getting worse? Is it much worse than other ones that are built the same way? Uh, comparisons are really good. The absolute values on any of these readings aren't necessarily a major issue. Uh, can we set scenario-based templates on the trending software and make comparison and warning levels, for example? Well, that's going to depend on exactly what instruments you're using. Uh, the, uh, the, the instruments that we manufacture, they have different warning levels built into them, which you can change if, if you have uh, experience. But the actual readings, the TEV level or the ultrasonic level, will turn red, yellow, and green based on numbers that reflect some of that data that we've gotten over time saying that, okay, it's gonna turn red at the level where we've seen 95% of the equipment uh, be, you know, if it's in that top 5% of the readings we've gotten over the past 20 years, that's where we set the red point. And maybe over the top 15% is where we'll set the yellow point. And that's built into the instrument. Uh, so you can have some scenarios, you can get warning levels, uh, but again, you're also gonna watch it over time. If something has been very quiet for years and suddenly gets louder, I don't really care what that absolute value is. I care that it's changed, something's changed. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Can we apply RCT detection on those unshielded cables? Uh, no, uh, you know, you, you could put an RCT around the cable and perhaps detect it, but then you are uh, subject to any kind of flashover from that. Plus the RCT wrapped around that cable could cause PD. You know, the, you're, you're putting something inside the high voltage field. Whenever you have an unshielded cable, the field is uncontrolled. And anything you place adjacent to that field is going to impact it. See, we have had customers put RCTs too close to the termination and actually cause PD with the RCT. Uh, so, and then, and then just a comment on that. And then, what is the mechanism to start service discharge with touching stress cones of closed phases. So the stress cones are designed to go from the internal shielded section of the cable where the, the field is very uh, high, but it, it's very consistent. It is uh, evenly spaced from the semiconductor around the conductor to the semiconductor on the shield. And when you go into the stress cone area, that gradually separates those field lines and they're designed to work into air. Now, if you have two stress cones that are touching uh, from different phases, or a stress cone touching a shielded portion of the, uh, one of the phases, then you're gonna have a real issue with the stress cone not being able to do the job it was designed to do, and you'll, you'll get PD. Uh, a lot of those pictures, most of those pictures that Tim showed is where they've all, this is after the stress cone. So now they have basically the insulation uh, of the, uh, the cables touching one another after the shield's been cut back. And that's obviously gonna give you a, a real high uh, level. Yeah, the picture that Tim's got up on the screen now, uh, there, it's outside the stress cones. Those boots are not part of the stress cone process, but they are still in the electric field. And the fact that they're touching one another and they're circular, they're gonna give you a really narrow point. And that narrow point is going to, by the nature of electric fields, concentrate the field there. And where it's concentrated, the air is not going to be able to withstand that field, 
and it's going to discharge. You can get a little bit of corona, a little bit of surface discharge. You get that white powder. And it's all due to the fact that I get two circles touching one another inside the electric field. And that's the last question. If there's any more, type them in now. And if there aren't, I think we're done and ready for the quiz. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so when I close this out, you should get a window pop up on your screen uh, that says this will be closed and you acknowledge the window and it's going to automatically open up a quiz. There are 10 questions based on what we just presented. If you uh, need to get uh, the NIDA uh, development credits, uh, you need to answer eight or 10 of them correct. They're either multiple choice or true and false. I tried to keep it uh, pertinent, but as easy as possible to for you. So it shouldn't be too challenging. Uh, once you complete the test, submit it. We'll get the results, go through it, and we'll issue the uh, development credits for your NIDA certifications. And we'll email that to you. So I'm going to end the webinar now, and that should create the questionnaire. Correct, Bill? That's what's supposed to do. As opposed to leave webinar. All right, you want to end the webinar.